In 2024, the Triathlon Hour is brought to you by The Feed. Thefeed.com is a website that has all of the world's best training and race day nutritional products in one place. The Feed's goal is to help you experiment with and ultimately find what nutritional products work best for you to get the most out of your performance in training and racing. They have almost 200 brands in stock, so you can buy as much from one brand as you want or as little as one gel from a brand. And I really do think that's the big benefit is you can try one thing from every brand and that way you'll find exactly what it is that you love and works for you. And having it all at one place at thefeed.com makes it convenient to do so. There's no more having to go to multiple websites and pay for shipping on them all and wait for them to come on different days or drive around to multiple shops. You can just get everything you need at thefeed.com and have it all shipped to your front door together so it arrives at the same time. He's the coach of Christian Blumenfeld and Gustav Eden, head of the Norwegian Method, and the podcast is always a better place when he's here. Olav Alexander Boo, it's good to talk to you again, my friend, uh, and thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me again. It's uh, I, I'm I, I'm I'm happy I didn't scare you off completely last time. <laughs> well, a lot of people here probably didn't even listen to that. Um, we got a lot of new listeners since then, but we did like a four-hour podcast, didn't we? Yeah, it uh, it uh, became a quite or uh, far more extensive than even I had uh, envisioned in my head. But it was, uh, I guess, it comes down to when you have a good interviewer, uh, things just just floats. Yeah, still one of my favorite chats I've had on the podcast. Um, Thank you. I am going to touch on some some things that we already talked about on that podcast, um, but just a little briefly. I, I sort of had an idea um, that we go back in time a little bit for this for this chat, Olav, and we work our way through to, to today. Um, and the, the time I want to go back is the week before the Ironman World Championships in 2022, where you had the two favorites to win that race in Gustav Eden and Christian Blumenfeld on the start line. Uh, and I want to I go back to the week before where on the, I think it was the Sunday before you did the 40K uh, tempo run that became probably the second most famous thing from that weekend apart from Gustav's win. Can you walk me through that week before Kona where you had the, the ultimately the champion and the third place finisher and what that week was like for you? Yeah, so that's, that weekend before was, of course, let's say the final touch-up or and it's a, believe it or not, uh, despite uh, the full distance swim, full distance uh, bike and uh, uh, full distance run, um, it still was a part of a taper. Uh, and the reason for why I call it a taper is because instead of doing it as an Ironman, it was split up over two days. So already there and with some small breaks in between as well. And it was also split up in a little bit into intervals. So it's more uh, what, what people uh, maybe forget a little bit uh, uh, is that um, these guys are elites. They train more than 30 or you know, 30 to 35 hours a week. Uh, and uh, Precision is, of course, key in uh, everything we do. And uh, if you can't really run, or let's say swim 4K, uh, even as intervals, uh, where you have some small breaks in between, and then you get a half an hour of rest uh, where you're just transitioning easy onto the bike, and then you go out and you bike 180K, so a four-hour four hour ride, or let's say a little bit more, four and a half hour, including the, including the um, uh, breaks uh one day uh, and then my question would be more to an elite uh, are you really then capable of finishing uh ironman at your best next weekend and the same goes then the next day when we then do some uh, shorter um shorter but a little bit more um a little bit higher intensity uh, but still still relatively low intensity but higher intensity intervals on the bike i think it was like maybe two two and a half hours or something like that and then on to the run where they run then i think it was 40 kilometer or something like that but again broken is was not 40k continuously it's broken up into intervals uh 
accumulating those uh, 40 kilometers. So um, that was, of course, then that was actually a taper because it was a reduction from what we have done then the weekends uh, or weeks before. Uh, this again and uh, after that weekend uh, when they had completed the run I knew basically the work was done and uh, really from there you just want to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible and uh, even even reduce the training load if uh, if one is uncertain because there's nothing you will be able to do then between let's say that weekend and the next weekend that will build any um build any capacity uh, or any power it's uh, rather the opposite doing a little bit too much now onward from there this being part of the plan uh, will worst case set you up for failure instead so the week came um and uh, of course one of the things that i already saw in the training was that we we had of course started our partnership with with uh, on running also the a couple of months leading before leading into Kona and one of the yeah the two things that was like I, I really en enjoyed with that partnership was one we there was no commitment for us to use on shoes unless we found it to be better so that's a part of the part of uh, the deal there because the shoes has has a too big of an impact on the performance much in the same way as a bike you can get far of course with most shoes you can get far with with most bicycles and for most people it's not going to be the killer for them but when you're fighting for the podium on the top there you don't want to give away a percentage uh, you want to basically have all the leverage on your side so of course in the training the main differences between the two guys was that they were on the same uh, or Christian was on the Kdex Gustav was on the Trinity and uh, we had fairly good control over the bike part and then when it came to the run this is where we worked uh, quite extensively with on running I have to be honest to say that I didn't believe we would make it to Kona with a new shoe because uh, Christian previously he was running or he was running in Essex at that time Gustav had been running in the Nike Alpha Flies um but uh, so the alpha flies became the benchmark for us when we now did rapid prototyping together with the on team and then uh, i think this was probably i actually reviewed the data here the other day uh i think that must have been something like uh, 20th of something of august we had a new run, uh, new test in the field with uh, the new prototypes uh, together with the on team coming up to Fontrome and where we actually saw that we had surpassed the uh, the alpha flies for Gustav, which was, uh, I don't exactly know, I remember the, the reaction, but it was, it was uh, I think we all got a little bit surprised how quickly things went when we first started uh, on individualizing the shoes. And of course, now when we came to Kona, it also started to become quite evident because Christian and Gustav uh, are extremely um, similar in terms of performance, both in the labs, but also out in the field. So when I were there, I, I felt very confident. I I, I wouldn't, if, if when people asked me, uh, and even my family or other asked me, who do you think will win between Christian and Gustav? I actually had to say hands down, I, I, I don't know. And really, I don't know, want to know either, because my goal is when I take on an athlete, is to make sure that everybody is equally well prepared for the, for the, to take the championship and uh, I I of course I started to see maybe some signs uh, the last last weekend leading into the race and I, I saw of course uh, Gustav was feeling very confident in the schools uh, in, 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 in the shoes and I, I remember even uh, Christian mentioning that uh, because Gustav had those shoes he said I want to take one turn here you have to do all the work in the front and the run uh, laughing of course a little bit but uh, yeah it was uh, everything was dialed into the smallest detail and 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 it was uh, we even had sat down and run quite a lot of weather, weather analysis um, so we had a pretty good idea of um, pretty good idea of where we could stay to set a new record um, on, on on race day so uh, the days now between that weekend, uh, let's say call it the infamous weekend of the 40k run and or the full bro broken uh, arm and distance uh, training, and then now leading into the race itself, 
that was um, days where I remember I felt actually quite uh, calm. I didn't have very much stress. Uh, we got plenty of time to, to or plenty or plenty, well, plenty in my standards of, of time to socialize with other of our partners and, and, and um, yeah, just uh, enjoy or stay there. Even me and Gustav had a trip up on Manukea on the on the on the very top of Manukea actually four thousand two hundred meters I think it is so and that was a couple of days out of the race so that was um, that was um, it was good days and so that week you had in my opinion and I think in everyone's opinion the best and the second best long course triathlete on the planet uh, under your tutelage as as the head coach we were going to find out which one was better that year. Christian had obviously won the Ironman St. George edition of the World Championships. Um, he'd beaten Gustav at the Collins Cup, but Gustav was probably the favorite going into St. George and then couldn't race because of sickness and then came back and he beat Christian uh, at the Canadian Open, where that famous race, the PTO Canadian Open, the famous race mm-hmm. where, where Christian was cramping. After the race at, at Kona, where you clearly had the best and the second best long course triathlete in the world, where Gustav ended up winning and, and Christian ended up in third, three minutes back with Sam Laidlow um, sandwiched in between them with his escape on the bike and, and strong run. What were your thoughts on those two athletes in Gustav and Christian after that race? Were you thinking about, like, did you think that Gustav had finally taken over as, as the number one guy over Christian? What did you think about their performances and, and what was going through your head after the race? Yeah. So after Kona, um, when, so the level we do individualization to, I know that uh, I will always, always try to do my best to make sure that both of them are as good as they can be. And we see that when you do like really good individualization for an athlete, uh, I'm not so sure about genet- genetics anymore. I, I actually come a little bit to the, con- let's say the, the realization that genetics has a bigger impact on talent early on, let's say in your career. So when you just start doing a sports, genetics can will 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 have a big impact on your performance. And by that I mean that. Some people are like they 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 didn't they haven't done very much training at all, uh, and then they just gets into a sport and they just looks like a super talent, uh, and that's where genetics normally um, becomes more evident. And uh, what maybe where you look like a talent in one sport, you might look like a complete noob uh, in another sport, and vice versa. That somebody that looks like a complete noob in one sport just looks like a super talent in in another sport. But as you get closer and closer to peak human performance, because this is what really fascinates me, and that is that we take, of course, pride in trying to measure as much as possible of what's going on in the body to try to understand it and see how can we better target uh, certain characteristics and, 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 and train them train their weaknesses and maintain their, their, their strengths or even maybe further strengthen their strengths as well. And then when 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 we do measurements, continuous measurements of, uh, of Christian and Gustav as well, it's very interesting to see that things that normally have been classified as uh, uh, typically elite athlete traits, uh, the body just figures out other ways to compensate for it when you expose the body for continuous and controlled stress over time where you where you give it uh, obviously enough room to adapt uh, between the sessions and, and over time. So in that sense, I, uh, okay, so it became Gustav's day uh, in, in, um, in, in, in Kona, but it's not like I ever thought that, okay, now, now it's, uh, now it's uh, Gustav moving forward, that will be the, be the winner. It would come down to the day anyway. Uh, much in the same way that uh, Christian underperformed in, in Kona, uh, not because he wasn't, uh, he, he, not because he couldn't have been there, and it could have been a sprint finish between the two. But simply, sometimes there are things affecting you on race day um, that that is beyond normal control. Maybe sometime in the future we can control that even better, or even on or make sure that even more uh, uncertainties are removed on race day. But uh, 
how it is now it is the way it is and and, and there are so many things you can control and and for me uh gustav's performance on on uh in, in in Kona was yes there he finally got to show what he is capable of and he is capable of even more um but the, but then again that's the same for Christian so it's just a matter of it comes down basically to there are so many things at this level that that has to go on tracks all the time uh, that uh, um uh, that if you had a static program, yes, surely, then you could just see, okay, here, this guy responds better to that program, and that's going to be now the trajectory moving forward as well. But as long as you start to individualize and you really work on on, on each of the athletes and, and you're trying to really figure out all the time systematically, okay, what do I have to change here? Does this work? No. Does this work? Yes. Okay, let's refine that one. Does this one work? No. Does this one work? Yes. And you refine. It becomes almost like a yeah like machine learning or ai where you go where you have a very systematic approach to each of the athletes and and what they respond to and what they don't respond to and now i want to go into 2023 the year we've just had um and i want to split the guys up i want to talk about gustav first and then i want to talk about christian because at the end of 2022 um, we obviously had the 70.3 world championships that gustav didn't finish and christian went on to win and christian finished up the year in 2022 as the number one ranked athlete um, he just lost to Chris, uh, to Gustav at the, the the Ironman World Championships, but he also had an Ironman World Championships and a 70.3 World Championships. And Gustav had the PTO Canadian Open um, and the Ironman uh, World Championships at Kona. So it was like people were thinking maybe Gustav at his best is, is better than Christian, but maybe Christian's still the, the number one guy in the world. Either way, the point is at the end of 2022, you had the number one and number two guys in the world, undoubtedly with Sam Laidlow and Magnus Ditliv, you know, at three and four pushing their case. But then 2023 happens and Christian stays at that level. He's still the number one athlete at the end of 2023 going into 2024. But Gustav has a year that almost none of us could have predicted. Can you talk to me as a whole about Gustav's 12 months? So, yeah, so after Kona, um, for Gustav, uh, they wanted, of course, to do the half Ironman uh, championship in St. George again, and with an extremely short transition over to uh, to uh, short course, just to get a feel uh, for the racing again. We knew, of course, that the race in, in, in Bermuda, uh, they would have absolutely no time to prepare for, because it was one week after St. George um so that was became more like okay you're just getting out and starting to do your short course racing again but without any preparations um uh then uh onwards uh i think it was three four weeks later uh three two three weeks later it was the race in abu dhabi and of course now we have gotten a little bit more time to to work on that um but what also is happening in this in this phase here is that the attention now around Gustav is quite intense as well. So there's a lot of things drawing his attention. At the same time, uh, Gustav now also have uh, his his mother is um, is uh, fairly ill from cancer. Um, so there's a lot of things going on. And, and one of the things that we very often neglect or we don't think so much over is that peak human performance or world championship performance um, is a place where all your energy have to be directed into your, your, your training, making sure that you, you, you get into consistency, that you're able to build progressively in your sessions and building progressively, you're already trying to build progressively on something that is already best in the world performance. So, so the margins are very, very small. I think we all have experienced, I, I think most of us have experienced stress in our lives and we know how much energy that can take out of us. And now you can imagine that Gustav is now trying to to come back into Olympic racing, which is extremely competitive. It's a very deep field, uh, and uh, and see where he is. At the same time, he has all these other stressors going on in his life, uh, and 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 trying to figure out of this new situation. At the same time, this is also now the first time since the, the the mother his mother was diagnosed with uh, with cancer that he was able to maybe 
yeah reflect a little bit more over the situation or not reflect but but let's maybe absorb absorb more of the of the situation then uh, of course as you know from a previous podcast with i think it was with christian and which of course has been written a little bit in the media uh, the christian and gustav decided to continue to stay outside of the norwegian federation there was additional stress with this and there were more stress coming in in months uh, months now after uh, ultimately uh Margaret or 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 um, Gustav's mother uh, died from from cancer in in May, and uh, they have always been a very they have a, they have very close bonds in in their family, and uh, but he he wants to keep up his routines, um, but it's it's uh, sometimes you could say that it's it's good if you if you if you have like a very regular job you you go to work at eight o'clock you're finished at four o'clock in in the afternoon and 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 you have a life where you um where, where you can spend more time on yourself it's also easier or let's say that the time maybe sometimes it takes to absorb absorb uh dramatic things that happens in your life um you are able maybe to absorb absorb them over shorter shorter time, but in in the life of an athlete where everything is about where you need to be fully focused on your training and making sure that you are you, you are you're getting out every bit of performance and that can be efficiency focus on efficiency for example in in a in a training workout which require cognitive presence extreme cognitive presence to listen to your body and all these small details that are and look, and always being mindful about what are you working on and how to improve this. At the same time, it's also something that is very energetic demanding because you're moving very quickly. And then in just after that one is the logistics of getting back to the house, the showering, you're making sure that you get in all the nutrition that you need and maybe you have to split that up even into separate meals and then you need to get in some rest in between there. And that means also that you have to block out your head or remove everything in your head that takes energy and other things like this. And then it's basically getting in another meal again, making yourself ready for the next session, making sure all the things are ready there and then you're out again. This is a life where everything is 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 oriented around always performing, and 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 there is not very much room for anything else really in life if you want to be at peak human performance or you want. And this is also what I uh, where I define the difference between a world world class athlete and a world champion athlete because getting to world class, uh, I I I I'm, I do I do know I come forward as a little bit bold when I say that, but but bringing people to world class is something you can do with most people maybe all people as long as they are willing to commit the time necessarily to do that but going from world class to world champion it's 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 another level i would even say that the step up from world class to world champion it's equally large as going from sedentary to 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 world class athlete and I think this is something that is it, it's it's for many people that are world class athletes. They 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 are able. They are they don't. They will never. Or it, it's it's very difficult to understand this before you you know what it is, and and uh, what kind of priorities, what kind of commitment it requires, and so on. Especially in sports where you have very deep fields. And um, then you don't have rooms. You don't have room for a lot of stressors that goes on uh, in your life. And you actually you have to be on. You have to be fairly cynical, even not because you want to be cynical or or because you are a cynical person, but you have to be almost cynical on how you prioritize your time. Meaning that you have to actually say a say no a lot. Um, I think it was Eliot Kipchoge that uh, said the, his famous wisdom so words of uh, people have to become better at vitamin N. And then the interviewer asked, vitamin N? And says, yes, no, saying no. That is uh, very true and, and something that uh, I think it's difficult to, to, to live up to and understand. And then also when one 
suddenly get all these stressors into your lives like Gustav had. Uh, he he got the full pack, to put it the least, last year. You are also much more vulnerable, and of course, it's Gustav had some uh, like uh, all athletes have something that pops up like, at random in, at random intervals, uh, uh, a knee that uh, hurts a little bit for a couple of days and it goes away, or a back that uh, hurts a couple of days and it goes away, or. Uh, whatever and for Gustav it has been the Achilles he have had the Achilles that has been um, that has uh, that uh, at, let's say call it a random intervals or not, not the random actually regular intervals let's say every second year he've had a little bit of a sensation in his Achilles for a couple of days and but then it uh, it goes away again this time uh, with the race now for the qualification to the Olympics so just having lost his mother uh, it didn't go away after a couple of days and it's been haunting him a little bit after that it's nothing dramatic um, nothing dramatic except from that it um, except from that uh, there is a lot going on in his life now and it's it, it is something we need we need to cope with and and uh, and um, then bring him uh, back to where he was and maybe even stronger uh, than what he had ever been before because it forces you also to take a couple of other actions as well that you 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 that we haven't had uh, or been forced to 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 work equally much on uh, before so gustav has definitely more potential in than what he what he demonstrated in Kona, we have to remember that uh, Gustav had only raced two races, two Ironman races. Kona was his second Ironman race, if I'm not mistaken. So in that sense, you could call him a noob uh, still when he was on the starting line in Kona, despite taking the uh, the record, uh, not only the championship but also the course record. Um, but um, yeah, for me. I think that uh, I think that uh, it will still it, it will still take some time. It will still take some time um, to to be there. But um, this is what we are committed to. This is what we do. And uh, if it had been like when things are easy, this is something that uh, everybody uh, can deal with. It is basically when you get uh, when there are struggles, when there are challenges. Uh, that's basically when you really have to. Let's say roll up your sleeves and 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 um, and uh, put in that extra effort that uh, requires uh, competence and experience and uh, an extra energy and that's what we like. We, I, I feed off challenges. I, uh, Gustav feeds off challenges. Christian feeds off challenges. So I think uh, even though it's frustrating, it's 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 still we still like the work. We like the work. We like the, we like to see that there is progress and surely there will be setbacks, but setbacks are good moments to learn and reflect. And then it's not uh, as a real setback either because you just know that, okay, this specific thing now we have learned this about that and it did have that effect. So then you know that until next time. And that's a good thing when that, when you, when you absorb and, and um, learn from your setbacks as well, that uh, you, the difference between between people that haven't been through this, they you, you are starting from scratch and you're gonna make all these errors. When you go through all these things, you learn what works and what you, what doesn't work, and you get better and better and better at this as well. So, um, long story short, 2023, uh, I can't imagine uh, any like where it in 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 a normally sane world where it would be possible to go through more stressors in one single year. Than 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 uh, than Gustav have done, but um, he is uh, he is a smart guy and he's a luckily a strong guy, so um, he'll come out even stronger on the on the on the other end. Something most of you probably don't know is that I coach a few triathletes on on the side of doing this podcast, and recently I took on a couple of new athletes. One of those athletes have been saying to me they felt ridiculously tired every morning and they really struggled with getting up for their morning sessions. And when they did do them, they just didn't enjoy them or really want to be there. So we put a whoop strap on them for one week. We gathered some data and we noticed that their sleep score was really, really bad. It was in the 30% range and they were only getting about 6 to 6.5 hours sleep on average per night. I recommended to the athlete that they just try taking pillar performance as triple magnesium every night before bed for two weeks to see if it made a difference or not. 
and that we'd revisit the data once they'd done that. And sure enough, five days in, they messaged me and they were like, oh, I'm already sleeping way better. I'm keen to see the data after two weeks. And so when we got to that two week mark, their sleep score was about 85%. And the biggest thing in my opinion is they were now averaging 8.5 to nine hours sleep per night, which is just a crazy difference. And the only thing they changed was taking pillar performances to magnesium 30 minutes before bed every night. They didn't miss a single night. And I've been saying that for over a year uh, here, every single week. But taking pillar performance to magnesium, in my opinion, 30 minutes before bed every night really does help everyone. So if you want to try it for yourself, head over to Pillar Performance's website or get it on the feed.com. Use the discount code TTH15 for 15% off your order. 2021 was also a big year for Gustav where he came eighth at the Olympic Games, which is the second highest finish of any Norwegian triathlete of, of all time at the, at the Olympic Games for triathlon. Christian, obviously, with the highest uh, coming first that year and winning the gold medal. And like you said, later on in that year, he did Ironman Florida as his debut Ironman, which was the only Ironman he'd done before Kona the year after. And he won Ironman Florida. And I think he went 7.42 on debut or something insane. I'm pretty sure it was close to that. And he won the Ironman 70.3 World Championships in still probably the best triathlon performance I've ever seen. Maybe Alistair Brownlee's 2012 London Olympics is the only one that competes, but in a very, very crazy performance. Um, the, the reason I bring that up, though, Olav, is, is mainly because of that Olympic Games, that, that, that eighth place that doesn't stand out in that year because Gustav finished the world ranked number one on the PTO rankings and, and had an unbelievable year. But he was, he was the second highest finishing Norwegian triathlete of all time at the Olympic Games. And, and then going into 2023, your team, yourself, Christian and Gustav, away from the Norwegian Federation because of the split, um, which you said, like you said, that, Gusta, uh, that Christian talked about on a podcast with me where the three of you as a team decided to, to stay away from the Norwegian uh, Triathlon Federation. And so you're in this pursuit in 2023 to make the Olympic Games. You have the, the, the defending champion in Christian and the second highest uh, Norwegian finisher of all time at the Olympic Games in Gustav. Now, we know Christian's going to be at the Olympics and he's going to be a threat there. Uh, and then you've just talked about the tough and yeah, shit year, to, to be frank, personally for, for Gustav professionally. It was just a, one of those years that he, it was just a tough year for Gustav. But then on top of that, he's had all this drama with what looks like now a situation where he's probably not going to be able to qualify for the Olympic Games. But can you talk to me about that situation in more detail, Olaf? To be honest, um, we I don't spend very much time on drama. It can be a little bit of let's say when you when you um, there have been. Well, first of all, I think it is also it is very important for me to say that we are not a trio. We are not a trio, um, as you might have seen maybe also from uh, the latest. Norwegian method uh, documentary part three. Orian Matson also is uh, quite, or is also featured there as well. And there are people from, we have people from Green Tag or Core, so the, the core temperature sensor that flew up from Switzerland to to work with us in that specific uh, that specific session there. We had Morton to the lab several times before. We were in Tenerife in October uh, with De Boer uh, working on uh, working on uh, wetsuits and speed suits uh, also together with surpass uh, months before there we were uh, in the wind tunnel uh, with surpass and and working on on uh, on the tri suits and we also worked together with body rocket on their system and they are even now making a road system uh, or a road version of uh, that system for us so that we basically have a rolling wind tunnel outside uh in in the field and there are many more to be mentioned not the least also our families and 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 uh, and also the the um, uh, western university of applied science and and uh, university hospital and and uh, research institution on the west there that also helps us uh, with so much of the things that we do uh, that this wouldn't be possible uh, without. So it is very important for me that it's not only the three of us. We, we There is a big team around us that uh, are contributing and, and really making a difference to uh, to what we do and that allows us exactly to do this search or pursuit for, for peak human performance. 
Um, but so a little bit how I am put together when it comes to drama and so on. Of course, when 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 you are sitting in discussions and other things, there are of course many opinions, and uh, of course we we don't have the final say when it comes to uh, who's gonna be in in a race or not. That's um, that's the let's say the federation and uh, and uh, and ultimately the Olympic Federation in in Norway. Um, but for me, it's more like okay, if you if you feel that it's it's it becomes hard to to cooperate with someone, then you just have to remove yourself from them. You you can't you can't continue to spend energy on that because it just becomes negative. It just takes energy out of you, and that's energy I should have spent then on, for example, on Christian and Gustav, making sure that everything around them is as good as possible. Um, and the other teams that are involved here, we are, for example, we have our software team even that are working on AI to help, let's say, crunching all the data uh, that we are working on. Uh, and and uh, uh, that's a place where also I spend quite a lot of uh, my time, my time as well. So, and then I I can't afford spending mental energy on um, call it processes or um, way of doing things that uh, that uh, that takes or that takes energy away from us. And then I'm put to put together in a way that uh, at some point I just make a cut and you say okay fine this doesn't work. Okay we 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 have to we have then we have to shift our focus and and make ourselves independent independent of that. And you don't spend any more energy on those processes or uh, or uh, call it drama uh, that is going on there. Um so I, I wouldn't say that for, for me it hasn't been a lot of drama. The situation is what the situation is, and if uh, like for any other athlete or any athlete there is out there, you have to. It's uh, it's uh, our responsibility to make sure that we are um, we are best prepared on the starting line. Uh, this had been said by many, many people before me, uh, athletes and coaches. So that's not, that's a not, I don't, or that is definitely not a unique, a unique uh, approach, but, but it is the fact, it is the fact it is, or it's not, it's not somebody else's responsibility. There, there's nobody else to blame uh, if we are not on, on, on the, on the, on the starting line. And, uh, when you realize this, uh, also you just know that it's not worth spending time on 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 drama or or uh, frustrating over the situation. You you just know that every day counts, and and you just have to make sure that you either stay on track and and try to progress, or that you get back on track as quickly as possible. And for me now, and 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 with Gustav. Um, it's about getting back on track, and that takes the time it takes. And 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 for me, whether he reaches, uh, whether he is able to be on the starting line in in the Olympics, well, probably there's a small chance for that. Kona, we'll just have to see. Uh, like I already said before, I the, the field would get more like being able to transition like we did from short course to long course. Is something we could do because we just saw that the field was not very deep in in, in Ironman one and secondly also that the way that the training had been executed there uh, we thought that we could do this much better by by approaching it more from a call it a physics perspective or 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 being much more systematic to to how we do it and understanding exactly what is important to develop in order to be uh, get closer to peak human performance in in Ironman racing. Um, but it's like Elliot when he ran first a uh, sub two marathon. Suddenly, there is a lot more people that starts to realize that they maybe have to do a change, and you believe that oh, this is really possible. And that is that uh, Elliot has not been the first one to show that records are there to be broken, and records will be broken again. And that is because there will be always be somebody that are pushing the limits. And the more you start to push limits in a specific domain, and 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 even in a subdiscipline like like for example Ironman, then you will get a stronger, stronger field. And I remember a conversation actually with Sebastian Keenly in 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 after Kona race. We were in is uh, at a podcast in in. Uh, um, 
in, in Kona together. And I asked him a little bit what he thought about the future of how it would be. And on his side, he thought that, well, the VTCS guys will rule Ironman. I'm not, I'm fairly convinced that uh, that is something of that we could do. We can still do it, but it's just a matter of time. It's still just a matter of time before you get people that really starts to dial in how to do Ironman training even more specialized. And what we do know is that if you want to win the Olympics, you can't do Nordic skiing until April or or, or May and then just transition to triathlon and, and win the Olympics in, in uh, end of uh, end of July. It doesn't work that way. It could it, maybe maybe you could have done that with a very smart approach uh, in two, Sydney 2000. I don't know. Uh, but you definitely cannot do it now because now it requires a, a very deep individualization and deep specialization and there are many of the things that we do when you specialize that yes you can you can change your view to max fairly quickly you can change your your threshold and and, and utilizations very quick very quickly but several of the factors that comes into biomechanical efficiency into biomechanical efficiency and so on takes so long takes so much longer time to develop and you, it's not like you necessarily stagnate either on that fall. It's just that you are you come up to a point where it starts to plateau, but there still is a development. And if you have then somebody that are a little bit further into that plateau there, they still have a small advantage of the guy that is close, or let's say that just have come, uh, come up to that plateau because he spent shorter time on that specialization. So specialization will be key in any sport where where you are where you are close to peak human performance and it doesn't leave room for for uh for spending a lot of a lot of time on on different sub disciplines yes i think it's good to mix it up to have variety because triathlon is still triathlon but you can't spend too much time on it and 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 uh, and um that means also that for for Gustav, yes, uh, days are passing by. But for me, the most important thing is to make sure that he gets back and he he. Uh, I'm confident he will be stronger than ever before, uh, simply because of the processes that he also goes through now. Um, uh, but whether that is in time for uh, Paris or whether that's in time for Kona, only time will show. You talking about when you you guys stepped into long course thinking like we can win the Ironman World Championships here uh, because of where the level was at, like you just talked about it. It always takes me back, um, Olav, to that famous New York Times article quote that you know <laughs> I love <laughs> where, where Christian sort of beat around the bush to the interviewer um, and, and, you know, in the way that he said that you guys were going to come in and win, he sort of said it a bit more politically than you. And <laughs> you, then, then you just said, it's going to be like taking candy from a baby. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, again, I, I, of course, I, I, I clarified a little bit on this before. It's not because I, I, I think that, uh, people who didn't work hard but uh, it became quite evident to us that uh, there were some gaps there or low hanging fruits that uh, would uh, would uh, not only give us marginal gains but quite big gains um, uh, when we came in there with the focus we had and with all the measurements we had done um that's why that uh, that's why why i probably put it that way um but uh, that is of course what is changing when a field gets deeper and deeper and people are really starting to push and they get more uh, scientific around the approach um uh, yeah i love it mate and you 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 backed it up that's the that's the best thing about that quote is that <laughs> on reflection it's just it's yeah. one of the greatest things um uh, my, my my last question about Gustav in 2023, and then we'll jump on to Christian's year in 2023. The PTO Asian Open in Singapore, where Gustav came back to race, it looked like in 2022, and even if we went back to 2021 and 2020, that at, at middle distance triathlon, Gustav at his best might be unbeatable. It really did look like that. Two times 70.3 world champion. The, the Canadian Open, it looked like he even had the best of Christian. It, it, like if, if, if Gustav and Christian were going to show up fit at their best at middle distance, it just looked like Gustav slightly had the edge. The Asian Open at Singapore in 2023 really couldn't have been 
any like it couldn't have been any more different than the Gustav we've seen at middle distance at at any other point in his career. And you've talked about the reasons why, so it's it's not to go over that. It's just to ask you, how did that feel watching that where Gustav came out of the water a long way down and then he was in the bike and he had that bike crash and he was it was one of the images of 2023 for me, um, not in a good way, in like a really emotional way, um, where Gustav was sitting on the side of the road and he looked quite broken, you know, like he obviously had the bike crash, he was probably in some pain. But it, it did sort of symbolise his year in a way, like the 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 come down he'd had from twenty twenty two, the personal struggles that you know we we don't wish upon anyone, and and then you know being on the on the start line at at a PTO race, which is probably his best distance, where he's unbeatable and and he's on the side of the road, you know, finishing finishing that race in that way, um, and it was sort of like the the, the accumulation of the whole twenty twenty three for Gustav. How did that feel for you as his coach and a close personal friend watching that? I think we are, we we already knew before that race that uh, uh, it would probably turn out that way. Um, and if Gustav had made a commitment to be on the starting line there. I think that if he hadn't done that, that probably probably we would already have pulled out before he wouldn't even go to Singapore. So uh, it didn't come as any shocker. Uh, it might came, it, of course, it, it looks dramatic from the outside, but from 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 the inside, uh, we were already prepared for this. Um, yeah, it's, uh, of course, it is frustrating but again i think it's of course more frustrating for gustav than it is for me because he is the one that is in the in the spotlight as well and 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 he of course understands he understands everything that is going on while the world doesn't and it's it's not like he's he can sit down and give like a 10 hour uh, insight into his life and everything that goes under and people would be able to un- understand that e- either because there is so much going on and um but again you just feel the frustration you have your fans and all the people that is around you that you really want to uh yeah to pay your tri- tribute to, to um and and, and make proud uh, of, of your performance. And then when you are there and you're racing and you just feel that you are going into a race and it's, uh, you know, more or less how the outcome is and you do understand that the world, the world, you're, you're not able to communicate it to a world in a way that, uh, that they understand. Of course, it becomes, uh, it is very frustrating. It is very frustrating and 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 quite tough. But that's also why one of the things that I know for sure is that we we are very good at writing training program, physiological training programs. Do this many minutes of this with this long break at this intensity during the intervals, this this intensity during the breaks, and so on. What we are not very good at. Uh, is that none of us have the same instrument. We can't measure the view to max of psychology. We can't measure the uh, threshold of your uh, psychology or or different mental characteristics and so on. Uh, there are all these kind of tests and methods are are, are fairly vague and, and they normally develop through, for example, conversation with professionals. Um, um, but, and, and that means also that... W- having a very systematic approach to psychological processes is something that it, it it requires very special skills and most people never go through this uh, at least not at this stage of in in their lives um uh, dealing with it and many people uh, break in this in this process as well but one of the things that I'm, I'm i'm very confident with is that the process now that is around gustav and i see how he is approaching it and uh, i know that this is a place where he is getting mental training or psychological training that uh, he will become even stronger from and that is something that he he will even then have with him when he is on the starting line in the in the future so it's it's um 
I think it's it's difficult. Uh, it is really difficult to like give people a really good understanding of what this is, and and, and or, or what I mean by that is more like okay, how, what is really going on, and, and so. But uh, at peak at at peak human performance level, there is really no room for spending half a percent of energy on something that doesn't move make you faster. Uh, it will make you slower. But then again. We know that sometimes when you are when you want when you need to work on your technique or you want you have to work on on, on uh, uh, different sub skills, uh, sometimes that can lead to a setback or seemingly it looks from the outside measuring velocity as a setback before you make two steps forward, and that's that's a little bit approach that is now that this is something that will for sure make uh christian no gustav uh gustav even um even stronger and so now we'll, we'll switch to to christian's 2023 or really i guess from I, the ironman world championships in 2022 until the the current day at the start of 2024 it, things could not have been different <laughs> like they were polar opposites gustav and christian from basically the the day following the ironman world championships where it was like Gustav was on top of the world, but then Christian goes and wins the Ironman 70.3 World Championships. Gustav doesn't doesn't finish. And then 2023, the, the year Gustav had, while Christian maintained his position as probably the, the most complete and best triathlete, uh, male triathlete on the planet. He came second at the PTO European Open. He came third at the US Open. He won the, the Asian Open where we saw Gustav on the side of the road. Um and then he was obviously also going a bit better than Gustav in in his like dream to go and win the uh, the, the Olympic title in 2024. So they really had very different years. Can you talk to me about um, Christian's year? Yeah. So uh, so fast forward from Kona uh, again. He won the 70.3 World Championship. Uh, then came uh, Bermuda and Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, with uh, which again was more just to see okay where are we in terms of racing because we can do all kinds of testing in the field and in training and in the lab and everything but in the end it's it, it, the real benchmarking happens in in, in a race um, but then again the races happens when the races happens and, and and it is in between those races we have to be smart to make sure that we make the best out of our time but um, then uh, we go to to uh, high altitude training in the Atlas Mountains. Uh, they both get sick as well, which again also makes for a horrible start in in uh, in uh, January or February when we come back come back from 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 altitude. Uh, so we're already starting at the wrong uh, wrong end. We continue onwards to Sierra Nevada, and now things are starting to to move uh, to move better. But uh, it and we knew. I actually, I think I, I probably said this before, but I, we we already knew that after Kona, or let's say after the long course racing, it would take us probably until the test event to be back at the podium. And that was the goal. The goal was to be able to climb and, and, and figure out what we needed to change and to get back there so that we were in a position to be on the podium in, in, in the test event. One of the things that maybe uh, I underestimated a little bit uh, in this process was also that we had been like since uh, 2018, 19, 19 maybe, we we had like a really intensive build up to towards Tokyo Olympics, um, and then of course the year before, let's say 2020, when the Olympics should have been and COVID was full on, of course that it gave a little bit for a good uh, for a good rest, you could say, uh, because it became a little bit more, less stressful. But at the same time, we didn't dare to 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 become let's say okay fine then we have one more year so we can just relax a little bit more this year and then get back because we assumed uh that everybody else would prepare continue to pe prepare uh, like full on uh leading into the into the um, olympics now move to 2021 so and we knew also that some of the competitive advantages that we knew that we had in 2020 suddenly now the other teams would potentially have a more time to catch up 
with uh, with some of the research and some of the uh, programs that we had built. Um, so it it became still a year with a lot of travel uh, just because of travel restrictions. So we had to go to camps and we had to stay there for fairly long time periods of time. But and and then onwards for from the Olympics, normally you would now slow down and take a year where things are a little bit easier to 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 get let's say shift your focus on. We didn't. We went straight on to long course championship racing. So so Ironmans and and PTOs. Um, uh, and had to figure out how to do this. So one thing is what we, we we had planned in theory, but then you also need to practice this as well, and and, and deal with the the things that you you uh, you haven't foreseen there. So uh, still full on uh, Florida, Cozumel, Saint George, uh, sub seven. PTO, Bergen, uh, sprint distance, World Cup, uh, uh, and then onwards to 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 uh, to ultimately to Kona, half Ironman World Championship, uh, Saint George again, and now straight back into to short course racing again because we knew that we were already at a one and a half year deficit compared to our competitors. Our competitors already have one and a half year of more specialization, and like I like I talked about, like you have this you have this curve you can you can gain like uh, you can raise your view to max and other things like very quickly but this small small details when it comes to efficiency and everything like this it takes really a long time to 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 uh, to bridge that in there you can almost imagine when you're running all these strides over a 10k for example you don't want to have a missed stride and and you will have a lot of missed strides or not like like let's say the most optimal strides there and if you can reduce one of these strides two of these strides 10 of these strides that's already a competitive advantage it's easy it's it's easy sometimes to forget to look at it that way because you just think of running as a running and that you there's a threshold or whatever that is there but it's all these details so we knew our competitors already have one and a half year uh, of a competitive uh, or let's say um, advance on us uh, in terms of training and specialization leading into into uh, into Paris Olympics. So we had to really turn around quickly and just make sure that everything we did had we were maximizing the quality of all our sessions, low, medium, high, how we did intervention, how meticulously accurate we were in in, in everything we did. Um, but again, this is also something that requires you to be 100% present mentally, cognitively. Um, and maybe one of the things that I, uh, or I think we all underestimate a little bit, is maybe that we this break is something we need a little bit. But it's not something, it was not, it, it became more of a natural call. It 2023 became, funny enough, a little bit of a, of, of a, of a, year with more fun and where they switched back and forth still a little bit long course short course racing uh uh doing the pto uh races and like for example when christian went into um into for example the race in uh, ibiza he had virtually no training on the tt bike same again when it comes to to uh to the race or the us open uh where he um where again he jump he 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 does his last sessions his last sessions he, he completes on his TT bike and we have no time to really uh, adjust position or make any changes there to the position on the bike there uh, because this is also something that is dynamic you can't just fix a position on bike and believe that that's going to be good because it, the position of on on your bike especially when you transition from a road bike to a TT bike is something that you also have to do a little bit gradually so already on one of the sessions there I think this was maybe the last session or or of the couple of sessions that he had i think on one of the sessions i was sitting on the car behind him and i made a comment a remark to his knee movement or basically how he was moving his 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 i think it was his left was it the right i think it was his his left his left foot and he also said yes i i feel a little bit like almost like i'm I, it's, it's a little bit too like almost like i'm cramping up a little bit there but i'm able to keep a little bit under control he is stronger than ever, uh, and like he says on 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 the, in the Norwegian Method uh, Part Three documentary, he also says that he was putting on bike 
power numbers that he have never done before. And this we saw also in the US Open. He comes out of the water. We have now been working quite closely uh, with uh, with Arian as well, being dedicated on to following them up on the swimming technique and everything there. So he's coming out of the water now in the lead uh, in the lead pack. Uh, jumps on the bike, uh, opens up a gap fairly easily. Uh, and of course, I have more data to back that up because one thing is just the velocity. But of course, I see his power numbers, what power he sits at. I see what uh, heart rate he sits at uh, and so on, uh, the core numbers. So here he opens up fairly easily a gap, but then suddenly he starts to 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 feel it more in his groin again. And uh, and uh, he, he completely cramps up. Um, and that's uh, the rest is history um but this is of course now with this experience we just know that you he couldn't go into singapore singapore for example with this condition so i think like this year becomes a little bit a year for us that i because i, I even asked uh, christian do you think it really is smart to go to the to the us open and do that race a couple of weeks before paris test event the, the most imp- what is the most important race of the year and then he he puts a grin on his face yeah yeah it, that will be really good for my preparation he says like also smiling back so both i and he knew that um, this was more about that he, he this is something that he would like to do and i think also the reason why it was easier to accept this as well was because in hamburg which was uh, first ever in history it was a super sprint race at the highest level this is the polar opposite distance that we had been racing at. And here Christian now clocks in uh, just behind the his, his uh, Alex Yi, uh, Hayden Wild. Um, I think Hayden, he 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 went out. The, the, the really cool thing there was that Hayden uh, he had a like a master planned uh, his, his his transition and he 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 played that card. In the very last race in Hamburg, which was brilliantly executed, and he now, I think this shook, this completely shook uh, Alex Alex Yi as well. Um, when suddenly Hayden goes in and he just opens up suddenly this small gap on the last part of the bike, coming into the transition, having a gap there, and he goes out. Uh, but what we see in the race, if you look at the splits, he doesn't run faster. He just maintains that that, that gap that he has there. Um, and and Christian now runs together with Alex Yi, uh, which now of course is he he was the fastest in the test event uh, in in Paris. So we see that he is basically he 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 is now basically where we need to have him with with fairly little let's say call it far less specialization that many of our competitors had. And that was also why it was easier for me also to accept that, okay, fine, the, the guys need a little bit space this year. They need to be able to do a little bit more. But we all agree that this, like 2023, after 2023, 2024 would be all in for the Olympics and only the Olympics. Um, because we still need a little bit more work and 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 that means that over the next half year now we need to really fine-tune that and and get out the best on race day in paris because that's when it counts so uh it became a little bit of a year where you could call it uh it's it's, it's a funny way to take a, a break but it became a little bit of a mental break because they switched a little bit they, they they continue to switch a little bit back and forth especially when we had the confirmation uh, of that things were really on track and uh christian and christian in particular of course not having any issues at all was on on track at the end of the season uh where we where 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 we hoped to have him before we converted back to short course again um and and, and and again, Gustav. There, uh, there were unfortunately other things also requiring his uh, attention that um, he couldn't decide to uh, neglect, but had to to spend his energy on uh, from losing his mother in 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 May and uh, then onwards with uh, other stresses. Yeah. If you've never used form goggles before, you're missing out. As soon as you put them on and wear them for your first swim session, you get out of the pool and you realize, I wish I'd been wearing these for the last few years. They give you live pace as you swim so you don't have to look at the clock or try and guess what pace you're swimming as you're doing your intervals. 
And you don't have to try and click start and stop on your watch every interval, which is something I really like. And something else I really like is that you can put workouts into the goggles. So before you go swimming, you just chuck the workout into them. And then when you jump in the pool, literally all you have to do is follow what your goggles say. They really make boring solo swims fun and motivating. So if you're someone like me who gets a little bit bored going to the pool by yourself, they're literally perfect for you. Head to Form's website and use the discount code HTT15 at checkout when you buy some for 15% off plus a year's free um, premium membership. And realize why every professional athlete you see seems to be wearing them. They really do make swim training more motivating, funner, and, and way more specific and easier if you are doing sessions and workouts. You'll love them, I guarantee it. And so now coming into 2024, did you as a team, Gustav and Christian, I know both very different circumstances, Christian, one of the busiest race calendars of the year and Gustav, one of the quietest race calendars of, of the year, did did both guys take um, an off season going into 2024? Yeah, so so Gustav, we actually decided after the PTO race in Singapore that he would take an off season simply because we, we, we when we... So we had already done during that summer both uh, the clinical assessments of his of uh, his uh, Achilles, uh, and then uh, we did MRIs and uh, even more follow ups of of the different other specialists as well. So this is something again, it's it, it it's it's no rupture or anything. It's simply an uh, or call it simply it it's an inflammation. It's a small inflammation in his Achilles, but enough. That it basically doesn't allow him to uh, to um, go go full out on the running. He has to be careful. Um, so, and one of the best ways to 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 get rid of this would normally be to just take rest. So take a short take a break and and, and let it rest a little bit, and then of course get out and walking. So it's, when we're talking about resting, it's not about laying flat out on the coach. Um, but at least reduce the high impact loading and, and taking it easy and, and walking and other things mean make sure that you yeah move, moving a little bit and then of course doing now more specialized work uh, specialized uh, uh, exercises as well uh, so actually we we don't do much strength training at all uh, or, or we don't we don't do any strength training because uh, for me everything we do into a program there have to there have to be a reason for why we do it. So, uh, but in this period, it made completely sense to start to do more strength exercises for for Gustav. So we brought in more specific uh, both uh, uh, exercises to work uh, both on his Achilles, but also purely maintenance as well, as he could he couldn't do as much running as he had previously been able to do. Uh, to maintain as much as possible function um, and. Uh, and uh, but but his off season became maybe like one of the bigger off seasons that he've had in a long while. Christian also he um, he struggles with taking off seasons, uh, so he 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 was almost to the point asking. Uh, I didn't ask every day, but it wasn't far from it. I think like, can I go can I go swimming tomorrow? Uh, <laughs> so but but he he. Um, I think he had like two weeks off, which was like heavily reduced training. Uh, and it was more uh, whatever he wanted to do, the training that he did. Um, so a fairly big reduction. Um, uh, and then we started gradually to ramp it up over one week leading into the race in, uh, so the Super League race in uh, in the Middle East. And uh, from there, we started to build again. Now, that was in, when was that? That was must have been in late October, I think. Um, and then, yeah, then we went back into the lab. We started to do now, uh, go through the normal battery of testing plus some more. And um, uh, then we went onwards to Tenerife. Uh, at the, and we spent uh, half a week there together with the, the Boer and Surpass working on uh, on uh, on the wetsuits, speed suits, and so on. And then onwards to the Atlas Mountains again. And then we started really to build up, uh, build up the training again um, for now this season come. And so I want to talk about... Christian and Gustav's 2024s. I'm actually going to insert what you said on on that YouTube video you talk about the Norwegian method 
uh, the the part three, the testing that you did, because I just found it so entertaining uh, when when, <laughs> when Christian was doing the testing. And I, I can't remember your exact quote, I'll love, but it was something along the lines of, we cannot release this. And I'll, I'll insert it here now so that people uh, know for context. This is insane. This, 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 this cannot be published. This actually have to stay here. (coughs) And then I, so I sort of thought, wow, what is this data that is so good that all, even Olav, who he's seen what Christian and Gustav have been doing for the better part of four or five years at the top of the sport. What makes this so special that we have to test it to see if it's accurate for starters, but also Maybe it's so good that we don't want to put it out there. Can you explain it to me? So actually, it's not. It's actually not because it was so good that we couldn't put it out. I, 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 I have no problem. So we are very open with everything we do. That's why we let camera teams come into the laboratory. We are very open in interviews and uh, and so on like this, uh, because we, <laughs> a, a secret is. Uh, well, keeping a number secret it's it's like okay uh, what does it mean um how do you get there uh so the reason why i said we cannot release this was because basically the numbers was so much higher than ever this is the highest view to max ever recorded in history that has been that has been published uh and not by a small margin but a quite good margin and when you produce records like this the last thing that i want to contribute to people think that this is i, I saw some comments that it was about oh this is propaganda or blah 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 blah, blah. To, to be honest i i couldn't care less I, I i really couldn't care less because i have no i have no need to contribute to drama or propaganda or other things like this so so uh if you it it, it, it the, but what i don't want to contribute to is basically releasing numbers that we can't back. So when I saw these numbers, this scared me a little bit uh, because uh, there have never been documented these high numbers before in the history. And when you, like I said to Christian many times before and Gustav many times before, we are in a domain, we are in, in, or we are in a place and time where we are already far outside what any textbook have ever before documented. So basically, when when, when we are looking, okay, so, okay, so did we now we have these numbers and when we see this, like, okay, what does the textbook say? No, there is no textbook. There is not even anything close, close, uh, closely uh, to what we are doing. And there is no research on this. So you basically, you're making your own way. You are basically in a domain where you just, have to use, try to use as much as possible common sense and understand, okay, what what will happen now if we just continue as we do? Is it, will then think, will will things break then? Uh, Or or will it just continue? Are are we doing, are we still in a safe place because we're doing things so precisely and and monitoring so much and when we, we, we feel in pretty great control over the most important markets? Or are this at a point now where it's just a matter of time where we basically figure out something that we don't want to figure out at all? So when I saw that number, because this you have to remember, there there's a camera team there, and of course uh, people likes when when there had, there was a lot more things being said there. So if this had been like a liner uh, liner uh, production where you would just like see in real time what happened every t- every every second from we basically came into the lab all the way to the test there. When I said when I well, let's say when this sentence that has been cut in there in the beginning of the of the documentary is 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 there, and then afterward, you would of course see that it it's it's far less dramatic, and it sounds like it, it, it is it is more where I just say that guys, this is uh, or to put it in other words, it's more where I just say to the team that the numbers we just have produced now, I have to validate them before this can be published, or the, because if we publish. Here, or if people just puts out some something on social medias now with numbers that doesn't add up, that will that will uh, uh, hurt our integrity, and and I don't want either to be a part of 
publishing numbers that are not validated. So that, so one of the things that I, I've, I've, I've uh, that that when you do all these kind of measurements is no, it's it's fairly easy to trick equipment like for example we know you can trick a power meter if you want to trick a power meter you can trick a gps if you want to trick a gps you can trick uh you can trick a calimetry machine if you want to trick a calimetry machine as long as you understand the technology that is behind this and that's and of course i've been speaking i speak a lot with christian gusta about the strengths and weaknesses of different equipment and, and instruments we use and why you always have to take data with a with a pinch of salt all data no no, no matter what how how accurate you believe it is you have to take it with a pinch of salt and that's why when you produce extraordinary numbers the the only the only way especially in those situations if you're going to use the numbers you have to validate them against an, another external gold standard source and uh one of the things that became because you, to tell you a little bit about the procedures for how I go through, for example, calibration of the calimetry machine. Before each of the tests, I do a double calibration of gas and volume. And the reason why I do a double calibration is already to look for the stability of the machine. Is the machine st stable or is it not? So if I do do calibration and I see there is an offset between those two calibrations, I know already now that the machine is not stable and I, I, I can't use the machine. So that's why I do a double calibration before I start the test itself. Then when we start the test itself, the guys are already starting to use uh, the calimetry machine on during the warm up. And the simple the, the simple reason for that is, is because we know uh, the biochemical efficiency of Christian and Gustav from all the tests we have done. And this, of course, changed a little bit. But we know very tightly that when Christian is running at a certain velocity or when he's outputting a certain power number, then basically I sh this is the this is the VU2 number that should show up on the machine there. So there you already have also a, 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 a call it a, 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 a way of validating whether a machine is good or not when you, when you compare now uh, the velocity numbers with the oxygen numbers uh, or the power numbers with, uh, with, with the oxygen numbers. And if you have both power and you have velocity, then you have two separate sources as well that you can now use as a reference to your VO2 to see if the numbers are good. So now already during warm up, I would have an ID even now if there is a, if there, if the this is looking good or not, or if I have to make some adjustments to it. And then we start to go through the step protocol itself. And again, now every step that you go through there acts as a validation of the machine. Because it's not like you, if you start to see like a sudden jump or, or decrease in VO2 or VCO2 and, uh, uh, comp uh, uh, at the same velocity or same power output, then you know already there is something here that is not the way it should be. And then finally, you come to the VU2 max, and of course, uh, we I do uh, double VU2 max on them as well uh, for a lot of reasons. But uh, then again, you should also on both of those VU2 max tests see the same number, more or less the same numbers. They will they will not be this, exactly the same. They will be a little bit different. But I'll come back to that later in a research paper that we will be publishing sometime after the Olympics. But you will also see a little bit of dif differences uh, differences there. And again, there is also I have a team of researchers around me as well. So th th this is something that I work uh, work together on with with with, uh, with several others. But there also you see now that the numbers are the same. So everything so far, everything so far looks good. You know that the calibration are correct. You you've, you validate it on the submaximal steps. Then you do the VO2 max and you just see first time that this is that what, what on earth is happening here. And then on the second part also it, it's happening there. And of course, the, the, the I, I mentioned this in a sentence there, but... The good thing for me, at least, was to see that if he had been running the same velocity that he had been doing before, and now we saw that the VO2 numbers were this much higher, then there are two things here now, and both would scare me. Either one, the machine is, is there's something wrong now with the machine, and I don't know how much I can use this data anymore, because I am actually not interested in the VO2 max itself. I'm not interested in the VO2 itself. Like the VO2 number itself is not that interesting. What I want to what I want to know is that all the data that sits behind here and how we bridge that back into training when I have power and I have velocity and so on, and all the submetrics that goes below there. 
So the other so the other part here is that let's say the VO2 numbers are now correct and he was running the same velocity as before. That would show that would and we said, okay, no, the calorie machine here is it is correct. Then that would show up like a huge now change in efficiency in a negative direction. And this would absolutely not be good either, because that would mean basically he would empty his tank. He would spend he would be spending so much energy to cover a distance from A to B. That yes, super impressive engine, but is so is wasting so much energy that he is at he is already at at uh, at um, poor position because all the other guys that are running now the same velocity as him they are using much less energy, and if you can that means basically that they have a potential now to last longer before they run out of energy than what Christian does. Of course, I can come there. There are even more details there coming back now to the RR number or basically substitute utilization. But the point is that. We also have to remember that uh, even if we don't talk about substitute utilization, Kona, there was published the core temperature curves from Christian. And we saw that basically he was overheating towards the end of the race. And one of the reasons why he wasn't able to to uh, to bring up the pace. Christian won in the Olympics by a solid margin because we know that we have a solid heat protocol. We know basically how Christian responds to this, but he didn't have the data uh in, in 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 kona and one of the reasons for that was exactly that he was reaching critical temperatures i think he was like at 41 degrees uh when he came to the fin 40 41 degrees something that when he came over the finish line there and one thing that most people don't realize is that 20 if you put in 200 watts so if you have an efficiency a biochemical efficiency of 20 percent, that means basically if you produce 200 watts on your bike now that means that you're producing 800 watts in heat and where does that heat go? Most of that heat, parts of that heat goes to that you are, first it actually goes into your body and then it will be released from the skin towards the, to, 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 uh, to the surroundings. But it basically means that you're heating up your body now quite much quicker. So if you now have a, if you have now a very high number, but you're not very efficient, it will basically mean also that you will now start to reach critical temperatures much quicker than what you would normally do. And that will already set you up for failure, even though you have the most impressive engine in the world. So it's, we, have, we have to remember, big numbers are not always good. It's always in a context, and this is where you need to know how to balance all this, all this kind of thing. So fast forward, what I do immediately after this, because, okay, the, the, the good thing for me that gave me at least a little bit of uh, uh, why I didn't disregard the rest was immediately was because Christian was running 24 kilometers per hour to, uh, on the end there when we produced the numbers, which again was also faster than, than he had done before. So now when he was running at, uh, uh, so when I saw this, this was okay, fine, at least that is higher. So I know that would normally yield a higher VO2 max and then, unless he had plateaued already or a higher VO2, uh, whatever you call it. Um, and then, uh, but th that is basically also when I say like, because Everybody understood that these numbers now were sensational. They were historic. It was the highest ever recorded in history. And also just for the for all your listeners, there's a difference between machines on the market. You have those machines that measure breath to breath, and you have those machines that use a mixing chamber and where you don't where you don't uh, give numbers based on a breath to breath, but actually it's average over 30 seconds. Uh, and again, it's a mixing chamber. So you, you won't like this typically erroneous breaths that that breath to breath systems are more much more susceptible for, especially when you have these um, masks that have uh, sample lines and turbines have where you can easily produce. It's quite easy for everybody to just cr create pretty crazy numbers if you want. This is the reason why you use a mixing chamber system because you need the accuracy from what we do, and secondly, also to to iron out all these um, yeah to iron out all these uh, errors that that uh, that can that can be produced. But nevertheless, nevertheless, what I did immediately afterward. So first of all, I said nobody published this basically before I have validated the machine. But this is of course the part that they cut cut away because it of course it became more dramatic for the viewers and everything. Uh, and I don't blame them. Uh, I would, <laughs> I would say I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't like drama that much. So, but again, I do understand that uh, I would probably make for the most boring TV uh, or or uh, YouTube's if if I if I were the editor uh, or producer of them. 
Uh, so uh, the thing is here that uh, what I do immediately after is that I call up the the head of service uh, or, or the, the head the head of um, yeah service service ser uh, of service of these machines in Norway of so of the Jager Oxycon Pro systems, and I just said to him, I need you now to be with me on a conference call here, video call here. Uh, so every all of this is already documented by the documentary team as well. So the, the documentary team there is already filming this and, 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 and filming this continuously as well. But of course, they don't know these machines. So what I did uh, in parallel, but of course, we did, this is uh, cut out, but where I also then call, because I, I don't even dare to recalibrate the machine now. So after the test of Christian, I knew that I immediately now have to do a simulation or a validation of this machine while still, because there is, of course, still quite a lot of humidity in the system or in the mixing chamber. There are humidity, um, uh, temperature of the machine. There, there, There's a lot of things that can change if you, for example, now just pack down the machine, send it to the factory for validation. The only thing that can that they can just say is that, yes, when we run the test here in our laboratory, everything looks good. And that's 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 fine but what they don't know is if there has been introduced any errors already in the lab there they won't be able to know that so what i do now exactly because i know this and because i i i've, I've i don't know how many of these machines i basically uh, i have opened and played around with inside to see how the technology is put together and so on and of course with the partnership with view to master and so I basically call up that the the head of head of service and i basically say i need you to be here now on a video call with me while I basically go through all the steps here of the validation now or the simulation of the machine there. And so he is on a call and then we, we set up everything. We, 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 uh, we, we, I run to all the machine and he basically says, okay, this is already perfect. And it's already beyond what we do of, of validation of the machine because they don't test up to these high numbers that I do because they don't have customers normally that are producing this kind of numbers. So we go through the validation there, and after we have now done the validation, this was, of course, where I knew the machine is good. The, mach the numbers are exactly where they should be. Because on the simulator, we are feeding in. So this, these are gases, gases that are, are, are um, you, the, you can see in one of the pictures, there's a big bottle standing on the floor there. On in, in, And in this bottle, there's a carefully... Uh, filled or a very accurately uh, or calibrated bottle with gases that has a known concentration of CO2. It has a known concentration of, of, of oxygen, or you could say it has a known volume of oxygen, has a known volume of CO2 in it. So basically, when I now open up this and I run the simulator there, then basically, if the if now the calimetry chamber doesn't show uh, or the calimetry machine uh, doesn't show the same numbers that I know that I'm feeding in for the machine there, then I already know it's wrong. What I can, of course, do is I can establish an offset and I can start now to start to calculate where then probably the VO or where the VO2 should have been rather in the test. Uh, but that's already a poor position. That's not what you want to spend your time on. You want the machines and everything we have to be as accurate as possible. And luckily, in this sense, is also this is a machine. So the metabolic simulator we have is a, it's it's a gold standard machine to 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 do exactly this kind of of testing, and and. Uh, and uh, there are not many of these machines in the world. We are very fortunate, again, that our partners have this machine uh, and, and we, we can use that for, for validation of our equipment. Again, it doesn't make sense to use technology if you don't know that, if, if you can't rely on, on the technology or the instruments that you are using. So that's why, so you can see that in the video I did two, uh, so I did actually also what is not cut in there because it just takes too long time is that I do uh, a multi-point, multi-point validation of the system. So you go basically through medium or low, medium and, and high settings on on, um, on on the machine just to see that you get a curve and that the curve, uh, you have a perfect fit there of the curve. Um, and then the same thing I do then also on the view to master uh, as well, just to check that everything is okay there as well. And, and, and this way you know that you have machines that are um, according to, to references. And now after even I did that, then I did a new calibration of the system. So now I can look at the, the offset in, the, in pre, the double pre and post calibration of the calorie, uh, calorie machine. And uh, uh, and again, there I I have another checkpoint uh, check, checkpoint to see that the numbers are good. And now what I do on top of that is that I dry out the complete system. So I, I completely dry out now the view to master and 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 uh, and the uh, 
and the Oxycon uh, system. And then I do another simulation again on the system, but now you know, in, in when everything is dry and it's been it has been resting for I think it had then had it had been resting for uh, two hours, something like that. And I, yeah, I do a new simulation and then I do a final calibration on top of that. So you can imagine that this is this is something that you can't do. Like there's no institution or laboratory that can run testing like this way because it would be so inefficient and so expensive to do any do testing on people that it's 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 not uh, too costly equipment's too costly it's not viable uh, it's 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 uh, virtually impossible to do this but in my case where I only work with a, with a with a couple of athletes I can do this especially when we are searching for peak human performance but then to the numbers um Christian basically puts out more than 7,000. So you see 7,700 milliliters there, or a little bit more than 7,700 milliliters there. And this was something he held for, and higher as well, but he held this for two minutes. So this was not even like one single measurement that just came up there and it bounced back down again. And you could say, hey, uh, this has to do with breathing dynamics and other things like this, and you get a lower average number. The numbers were sitting there for 90, 90 to 120 seconds. So over, so basically then over three to four measurements, uh, two minutes, he was basically sitting up there. And even the highest number we had was uh, even past 7,800 milliliters per minute. Everyone's always confused about what nutritional products they should be using while they train and race and never really knows if what they're using is the best option for them. I can tell you from my experience of trying about 20 to 30 different brands over probably the last eight to 10 years that Precision Fuel and Hydration is by far my favorite. I started with Precision by trying their PF30 gel, which I really liked. And then I tried their drink mix, which I probably liked even a little bit more before finding the product from them that really took them from being I think my equal favorite brand at the time to, without question, my favorite brand, the PF90 gel. It's seriously amazing. And then more recently, I've been experimenting with their brand new flow gel. And honestly, I think it's now taken over as my favorite nutritional product I've ever used in my life. I don't ever do long rides or runs or hard sessions without it now. And if you're racing triathlon, particularly long course triathlon, or you're going to do a marathon, it's just the perfect way to get fuel in. Try it for yourself, head to Precision Fuel and Hydration's website and use the discount code TTH15 for 15% off your first order. And so you started to touch on this a little bit, um, what the numbers mean, but I want to dive into it just a little bit deeper. Um, Firstly, a number that everyone understands, what was Christian's VO2 max that was the highest recorded uh, in the history of humankind? And then you started to talk about what that might mean, the positives and negatives, but can you tell me a little bit more deeply what that number, that really high VO2 max might mean for Christian's 2024 season racing both the Olympics and later on in the year, long course triathlon? So um, for swimming, purely to, in terms of velocity, of course, you have standard sessions. We we have our test or we have our profile batteries and all these kind of things that we go through. And there, Christian and Gustav are, are significantly faster than, 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 than before. So what I mean by significantly faster, we're not talking here about a uh, uh, couple of tenths faster than what they've been doing before. They are uh, swimming faster, several seconds faster than what they have been doing ever before for uh, per 100 meter on the bike um uh, christian is putting out uh, gustav we are a little bit more careful with again because again your your achilles is also involved in cycling so it's actually just using uh, it doesn't use very much cycling shoes at the moment we are keeping it more like in in other types of shoes um uh, so for him We'll, we'll we'll wait a little bit more before we really start pushing it uh, again for him. But for Christian, he is putting out uh, probably close to... Uh, I'm, I'm throwing off a rough number here, but let's say at least 5% more uh, than what he have been doing before in history. Can you give me some like actual numbers? Like 
something that we could take away? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, for example, here he he talked a little bit about it himself, but uh, he could he could finish uh, threshold sets, for example. Of course, then he would go a little bit above max, maximum like the steady state. But typically, before he would finish them at, let's say, like M- MLSs for him would sit uh, stably over a 80, 80 minute session. Uh, would would stay around uh, let's say three three eighty to three hundred ninety watts. Uh, typically, then um, after Abu Dhabi, after let's say at the end of our altitude camps, leading then into typically the Yokohama race, Bermuda or Yokohama race. That's where. So so when we are like typically uh, half or let's say a quarter, let's say three four five months out of. Uh, of the Olympics, or let's say when Olympics are, every, uh, if you if you normalize it towards uh, July, end of July, beginning of August, so then typically when when we are uh, there, he would sit in around three eighty, three ninety at maximum, like the steady state uh, for an and typically for an 80, 80 minute uh, long session. Now he uh, during this summer he was sitting uh, well above four hundred uh significantly well above or he finished finished off significantly well above uh, 400 he finished i think uh, i it's a little bit now it's it's a couple of months since i just analyzed since last time i analyzed those sessions but typically there he would probably be like four he could finish off maybe those sessions i don't remember but what, what it was 430 440 watts for example again for sessions that are lasting now uh 70 to 80 minutes wow uh, and then on uh, now in the lab, he basically sits in around let's say five percent higher than what he does typically uh, for or, or when we are like really doing the or where he typically sits peak uh, during his uh, race season. He's now, yeah, let's say roughly speaking, five percent higher than that on power on the running. Uh, Let's say it's at least five percent higher. And what was the number? What was the VO two number that, of the video when he was on the treadmill running that that you had to check and recheck and recheck and recheck? What was the VO two max? Yeah. So 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 one of the things that I, I'm not I'm not a very big fan of relative numbers uh, because you you start to make a lot of assumptions when you do that. So typically people are used to report VO two max as for example or as milliliters per minute per kilogram. So you would do. You would do. You would take, for example, that number that you see there. So you see, I think, at the end of the tester, or basically what is, or, or what is shown at, in the picture is basically seven thousand seven hundred and something. Uh, let's say it's seven hundred seven thousand seven hundred milliliters. So basically, now to find his view to max, you would take seven thousand seven hundred milliliters per minute, and then you would divide it by his weight. I'd already done this, by the way. And before this podcast, because I wanted to confirm. exactly. And the reason for why we work in absolute numbers is because it doesn't make sense either when you talk about power. If I just gave numbers to you, like saying, "Oh, his power is a threshold; it's five, five, uh, five watts per kilogram," it's like, okay, that's fine, and you can compare it to other athletes. But then again. That will not tell you anything about the race russells. The reason for why it won't tell you anything about race russells is because raw power is more important than relative power. So if you have two athletes that has the same relative power, but one of the guys weigh twice as much as the guy, the other guy that has the same relative power, the guy that weighs twice as, twice as much with the same relative power will smash. Uh, he, he will basically uh, do circles around the other guy uh, racing. And that's why also when, when I work with VO2, so VO2 max has nothing to do with with kilograms but you can normalize it as kilograms if you want but it's more important for me because we i i we use all these numbers a little bit differently than than what is normal and that's why i need raw numbers i need absolute numbers and 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 uh, the number you see there is basically 7700 when you see 7700 milliliters and that was not even the highest number and then uh, it was slightly higher uh, in in average, uh, big, uh, but let's use seven thousand seven hundred milliliters. Then when you if you divide that by weight, then then uh, whether you divide that by weight or you don't divide it by weight, it's it's basically historical numbers. So people have of course heard about probably 
And cross country skiers having extremely high numbers. And of course, people have heard about Le Monde and other people, but I can't really I can't really attest to those numbers because those numbers are most likely done on breath to breath systems. And breath to breath systems are not made to do this kind of testing. They they will normally start to produce erroneous numbers when you start to approach over 40 breaths per minute, simply because there is something called transient time transient time when you sample gas from uh, so the sample line that goes from the turbine and and, and draws the gas concentration into them into the into the machine for uh, for an, uh, for analytics if if you have a second even if you have a second decimal uh change in that number or you match that second decimal number in concentration change up with the wrong uh tidal volume um you you'll already easily skew your uh, VO two results by five percent, uh, no problem at all, just on a single just on a single breath, and then you start to get this and again and again and again. So in this case, in this case here, that's why we use the mixing chamber simply because the mixing chamber um, acts as a buffer, and you reduce you you don't care you, or you 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 average out all these erroneous breaths, and it works also quite differently. Um, but uh, so there are many big numbers in the history before uh, I I there are very few if none that are basically being validated afterwards like this like we did here. Uh, but well, let's assume that all these numbers are good, um, um, because for all I know, they can have done a lot of other things as well. Um, for example, I love there's like Lance Armstrong, who you know, 84, yeah. there's Chris Froome, who I think was 85. That, like you said, um, a really famous example, um, was like Miguel Indurain and, and Greg LeMond of that cycling era. So I think it was like 88 and 92, respectively. And Greg LeMond's at 92 was seen as one of the greatest things ever at the time. And, and then there's been some Norwegians who have, you know, got into the mid 90s. Um, but I, like, like I sent you that message before this podcast, I said, can I ask about Christian's 100 plus <laughs> VO2 max? Because <laughs> yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd already done that. I'd already done that little equation before before I made sure I chatted to you. And and I I have it at look. I've I've put his weight in as many different things because I didn't have Christian on a scale that day. But I've got it at between 101 and 104. <laughs> Yeah, in 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 relative in in, in relative numbers, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, probably something like that. But then again, I don't spend even time on 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 calculating on his relative relative uh, power numbers either, because it really doesn't mean very much to me. Um, it's the raw numbers, yeah. But uh, you've you've done the math, uh, you've done the math, and of course, I I I've, I've I do the math in my in my head myself as well. But I think here. Um, again, just talking about the number, and you just say, if, let's say that you just use a hundred milliliters per minute per kilogram, for example. It it like okay. So what do you do about it? What does it mean? And that's where like like talking about it, this in terms of kilograms, it really doesn't make any sense at all. Because what I am after is the energy energy expenditure. How much energy is it turning over per time? And what does this mean in in terms of potential mechanical power output? And what does this mean in terms of thermal thermal power output? Um, and and what and then basically what will that mean in terms of burn down, for example? When are his when is he starting to reach critical numbers that we don't have to do? with so the consequence actually after this phase here is that i actually i said to christian that we we have now two options one is that or we have three options but but the, the third option being something in between the one option is that either we now have to bring up your uh bring up uh, your efficiency a little bit more uh and that would of course be uh, the best to do but again, that will require so much energy that uh, again we are in uncharted territory. We we are navigating in 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 in, a, in an ocean where uh, we we just have to find some new stars to to to, to navigate by that uh, we haven't used before. Um, because making any adaptation costs energy, and I'm talking now about hard calories that you will have to consume in order to do this, and maybe on top of what you have done before. Uh, and something that uh, you could even argue that uh, will be almost, uh, or it will be very difficult. But, um, uh, but that's what we like. Um, 
but we then have two and a half option. One option is that we either need to bring up his, uh, his efficiency. So that means that we are also seeing that we are getting up his velocity even of ever uh, a slightly bit more and his power output as well, slightly a bit more in swimming, biking and running. Let's use run, running in this case. If we if we are not able to do that all the way, the chances that he will that he will yes he can power away from everybody and then uh, but but he will eventually start to suffer when he comes then closer to the finish line and where uh, he he basically burns down because he's basically now wasting more energy than what what he did before. Yes, he is more powerful, but he's wasting more energy, and energy is definitely definitively not. Uh, um, an infinite resource, and neither is your thermal thermal capacity either. So one of the things you see in those videos as well is that we we have uh, Tobias uh, uh, from uh, from Core with us there, and we, Christian has plenty of core sensors around on, on his body, and that is because the core sensor does measure core temperature very differently than than all other sensors down the market. The way that they do it is they are measuring one your skin temperature, but they're also measuring your heat flux. How much how, how much energy do you actually transfer to the environment? I think we talked about this before, but it's like if you had had uh, this sensor, but in a metal version, you could basically put it on your stove or your cooking stove top. And if you put now two kilowatts of heat in on your on, on your cooking stove, this sensor would measure the heat flux. Now would basically show two thousand watts if you normalize it for this plate there. So the reason why that is there is exactly also because I, I need to know this number. So I need, again, what should happen here. And if I take the mechanical power and then I take the thermal power from these sensors and add them together, I would arrive at the same number that I'm measuring with the VO2, which we do, which again also is a third validation of the measurements. So uh, uh, the other option we had basically, as I said to Christian, that Okay, let's try to maintain this power now, or that that will be the easier version of it, but the more boring part of it. Let's just try to maintain, or we we, we rather now maintain this power output. We remain we 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 maintain this pace, but we have to reduce your view to max again. So we we have to we have to now, uh, and and that 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 can be simply done by uh, how you put together the, the the program. That's what we did when we went into Ironman. We brought down the view to max quite significantly because there were other characteristics that were more important to to prioritize to be able to race faster. So the boring part, the boring version of it would be then okay, let's bring it down. We have to bring down your power. No, we have to bring down your your energy expenditure. Uh, for uh, instead for this because we're not able to to sustain that energy expenditure and build more power and 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 pace uh, or velocity to really utilize it to its full extent and we again we are talking about margins it's not like you can just say that hey i want to have two milliliters more uh or, or let's say 100 milliliters more of oxygen or uh, not so raw oxygen uptake or let's say one or two milliliters per minute per kilogram extra in oxygen uptake without that that has a consequence it will have a consequence unless you don't adjust other things as well so the the good like the really interesting what we are trying to 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 see now is how we can even increase the efficiencies or not increase the view or let's say energy expenditure or his view to max even further but rather or, or view two at race pace even further but rather see how can we bring up the efficiency instead the biochemical efficiency instead so that he's able to 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 be uh to yeah put out sustainably higher uh power outputs and and, and velocity than than what they've done before uh or he did in this test even uh, and the third option is we might land somewhere in between we have to bring down his energy expenditure or his oxygen uptake a little bit but at the same time we're able to 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 utilize some of that increased v uh or oxygen uh uptake or energy exp energy expenditure uh or energy turnover is maybe more correct to say um a little bit so that he is able to run maybe even a little fa a little bit faster is uh, he's able to bike a little bit faster and swim even a little bit faster as well so we are in a place where we are we we are experimenting a little bit now with 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 what kind of protocols how do we build now the interventions the workouts the the uh, the, the intervals, everything basically uh, down to the lowest level, even where we are looking at intracyclic power. So basically, even how you are pedaling and everything like this, uh, and and what cadences this is done at, and so on to 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 
based on numbers that we luckily have collected before and what we know works for Christian and what doesn't work so good for Christian. But again, we are now in uncharted territory, so we can just use our best understanding of what what we know works for him and just see whether we are able to bring some of that back in here as well now, trying to make the next step. But as you can understand, this is it's an ever it's an ever or it's an um, continuously engineering project where you're just trying to engineer and and may optimize on every bits and pieces and 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 see if you can get out even a little bit more from this. So, in your mind right now, Olaf, in in probably the most simple and practical way that you can. What does the training look like with Christian going into the Paris Olympics to make sure that his high VO2 max can be used to the best of its ability because you've increased the efficiency of his uh, you know, aerobic system or his metabolic system as a whole? How can you practically and simply do that in training? Uh, again, it depends. Uh, well, if, if 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 I use Christian as a case, so one of the consequences that typically happens when you have an increased energy expenditure or energy turnover is that it takes a little bit longer time to increase efficiency. Uh, <clears throat> again, depending on, you can always look. Okay, why why do you have a higher energy expenditure? Uh, because it's not like you can just have a high energy expenditure without doing something for it. So you, obviously you have to do something for it. You can't. You can sit and ventilate as much as you want so that you can do voluntarily. Uh, but it's not like you will reach a view to max by just sitting in a chair and breathing a lot. And you will probably just faint off an, off an, from an oxygen hit instead. So uh, obviously you have to train. You have to train. You have to exercise in order to, to, to increase your, your, your energy expenditure. And because you're increasing your energy expenditure or energy turnover, there is a need for more oxygen. So that's normally how it happens. But then, of course, you can you can build now interventions where you are mixing nutrition and how you do different, let's say, nutrition uh, programs with uh, with uh, with um, uh, exercise. So, for example, uh, if you <laughs> the body is really smart, it 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 will sense what what very quickly what is going on so if you go into like typically people say that if you for example if you start to starve yourself off yes you will lose weight but suddenly it starts to stagnate and why does it start to stagnate because the body starts to sense you are in a calorie deficit um uh, and the same thing goes here we have to remember that elite athletes they are a lot of the time in, in a calorie deficit and the body is of course quite sensible uh, sensible to this so this is something that you have to be very careful with. And then the problem with, again, with triathletes and, and elite athletes is that they train so much that there's a struggle to get in enough calories or, and, and be in a calorie balance. But typically here for, for Christian, uh, this is, of course, if, if, if for another athlete, this would probably, this could have been, this would be different. Um, but for, for Christian now, it's, it's, uh, it's not only about the VO2 numbers. Uh, and how it is there because at the same time i'm also looking at his power numbers and his running numbers and then you start to look at them as well and how do he execute in order or to to keep that certain velocity for example first first level breakdown would be uh just looking simply at his stride rate and and, and stride length but then again you can break you can break down stride length and 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 uh, and, and stride rates into much smaller details, and of course, with, with motion capture system, you can even look at with with uh, with a uh, with millisecond millisecond precision on what is happening with the gait and everything, uh, and, and and how does it change? How do you produce a certain velocity? And then in this case, when you suddenly see that uh, when when there is a, where I see that there is more room for improvement in 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 the efficiency, so one is the biomechanical efficiency, the other part is the biochemical efficiency. This is a place where um, the simplest thing, if you just want to 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 shut down or you want to 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 to, to uh, to be honest, actually, I don't. I'm not sure if I. I don't want. Uh, the, okay, a very important disclaimer: Don't do this yourself. Don't do this and 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 think this is a smart thing to do at all because it it, it just will lead probably to poorer performance. But you could say that this, like in 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 the simple in the simplest uh, context, you could say that okay, if your energy expenditure is too high, so you have a high energy expenditure, 
so uh, like, like like for Christian and so on, then uh, and you see that this is not sustainable. Uh, you somehow now have to either ah, fuck. Uh, Okay, I, I'll tell you, I, we have to redo this one. We have to redo this one. But, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit what I'm trying to tell, say here. Because the problem is that when 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 pe if people think that, oh, cool, I can just start to manipulate how I'm eating. That sounds like a good idea. You'll end up trashing so many athletes. And 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 I, I don't want to be a contributor to that at all. I, I, I Like people should be healthy. And the mo first and most important focus of any training program should be the athlete's health. That's that's the single most important thing of any program that is there. It's not the performance, it's the health. If the health is good and you have a good program, performance will come. It shouldn't be the other way around where you're just compromising health to, to produce the best performance. I don't I don't know if you have to redo it all love because I think that's really interesting. Like you're just your what you're saying there is very important and almost never gets spoken about. Like I actually think it's a like it's a good message because you can talk about the reality of of what is performance but you but at the at the heart of all performance is health. Exactly. Yeah. And, and 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 it's not an easy thing, but you okay to give a very simple example here. If if this is on a bike, for example, so on a bike, if you see that you have a lot, if if for example there is a high oxygen consumption uh, or a high energy turnover uh, per time or per minute, uh, then or so basically a high VO two uh, oxygen consumption per minute, uh, and and you see that. Uh, uh, that the the efficiency or the biochemical efficiency, uh, whether you then quantify that as uh, as uh, how many joules uh, of energy that you release per milliliter of oxygen. So you get now number in joules, and then we know that one watt is basically one joule per second. So now you have two joule. You have two. You have two. You have you're converted into the same units. So if you are 200 watts, that's basically then 200 joules per second. If you are one milliliter, that is approximately 20 joules, uh, 20 joules of 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 uh, of, uh, of energy. So so if you are then one 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 milliliter one milliliter of oxygen per second, that's basically then 20 joules 20 joules per second. If I'm not mistaken, now, uh, yeah. Anyway. But you get the point. So already there, you can look now at the ratio between, okay, how much energy are you turning around per second and how many watts are you producing per second? One of the things that people don't realize is that the power number that you see on your power meter, for example, on your bike, is actually your net mechanical power. It's only the power component that actually pulls you forward. So if you, for example, sit now on the bike and you produce 200 watts there, but you at the same time deliberately like really start to almost backpedal on the upstroke, yeah, even though how difficult this uh, this is, or let's say you are trying to be as uncoordinated in your pedaling. As long as you stay at 200 watts, the only thing you will start to see there now is that your efficiency starts to 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 uh, to become much worse. And this is, of course, not good. Yes, it's 200 watts, and you can say, ah, oh, this is a good number. Uh, but then again, you didn't do this over 40 kilometers or 180 kilometers. You only did this over some steps here. And there are a lot of other things that will change as well. But this gives, of course, an indication a little bit of, of, of for example, of one thing that you can focus on. So let's say that you have now a high oxygen number for a fairly, or let's say for a, for a, uh, for a power number that you would like to see that is higher, that be, means in this case that if you then see that the gross mechanical power, so if you take the, the net mechanical power, which is reported on your bike computer, that's so that's a forward proportion. If you have now an advanced power meter, that would ab allow you to both not only have the net mechanical power, but you can also actually now have the gross mechanical power. So when you now have both the net mechanical power and the gross mechanical power, and you see there is a too large discrepancy between them, then you can break down. So why is it there? And then if you now start to see that, for example, that you have a very poor, very poor uh, torque efficiency, for example, shouldn't you, you, we are not talking about perfection here or a specific number, but you just see that it's below par based on uh, what you know is best numbers for this athlete, then you would start to focus on bringing that back there. And then two things can happen. There are many things that can happen here. But one is that, yes, maybe your power, your oxygen consumption comes down because you're not able necessarily to just keep that gross mechanical power and bring your net mechanical up, net mechanical power up to the same ratio as you had before now. 
but the gross mechanical power comes down a little bit. And as a function of that also, your, 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 your oxygen consumption also will start to come down a little bit. Maybe not the same ratio, but it will also come down. The best case scenario, of course, if you, if you are able to sustain this, because again, we have to remember when we look at numbers this way, we look at them in, in a one-dimensional way. We don't, we don't account for 40 kilometer or 180 kilometer. But that's where the size of your tank or let's say your size of your thermal battery comes in. So how much heat are you able to tolerate before basically you're reaching critical temperature? So, so, so you can say that if you have a lot of plasma in your body, if you have a lot of mass in your body, that of course uh, allows you to store more thermal energy before it reaches a critical point. But the problem with more mass again is exactly that the surface area to the volume area in your body. So when you scale something up, it scales up with the square cube law. So if you double the size, if you double this, the, 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 the surface area of a human, basically what happens now is that you have, incre you have increased the volume inside the body by, 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 by the cube. And that means, again, that there is now a cube more, a cube more muscle mass and other things that are producing heat there. But all that heat can only now increase by the square increase in surface area, which is, a, which is potentially a bad scenario. So uh, it's it's uh, it... <laughs> we are so deep into the details now that it's 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 a little bit hard almost to bring it back up again to the to to the to to the surface. Uh, but in general, uh, to try to to get, provide a simple answer, simple answer to um, uh, so what do we do? Uh, simple answer is that we are working now on efficiency. So we we. We have several periods before where we've been working simply on efficiency, and we 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 have an uh, at least an understanding of what had worked before when we work on efficiency in terms of uh, biomechanical efficiency, in terms of uh, biochemical efficiency, and so on. And that's a, we are doing part of that now, but trying to be even smarter in order not well to get try to get the both of both both of bo both worlds. One is a uh, simply high, even higher velocity and power, but at the same time also uh, increasing the efficiency to a sustainable level where he can sustain that over a full Olympic distance. But again, it will take time. Times before when we have done the same thing and we have increased the energy turnover uh, uh, more rapidly, it can typically lead, lead to, let's say, that you get you get a couple of races that are where you are underperforming simply because you also need to learn to use uh, these skills better. It's almost like if you are playing uh, uh, or if you go out with a race car and you suddenly somebody changes your, your suspension system and brakes and engine in the car there and the aerodynamics of the car. It's not like you can just go out and drive it faster. Because going through the corners now and how you basically, what kind of strategy you use actually re actually requires you to start to reprogram a little bit your strategy and a little bit how you do racing because your capabilities have changed. So it's complicated and, 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 and uh, in, in, in one sense, but in other sense, it's not so complicated. I think... When when you have been playing around with this for a while, you build up an intuition what works and what doesn't work, and a little bit what direction you need to pull things in. But if you if you if you're not used to this, then of course it becomes overwhelming because it's an overwhelming amount of information. Uh, there is an over you you don't know how to deal with this. You don't know why this is happening because you haven't seen this before. Um, yeah, so so it's um, I don't know if this answers the questions really or not, but it's. Uh, it is what it is. For about two years, I had this foot injury that was really killing my run training. I'd do this same pattern where I'd run for two to three weeks, sometimes four weeks, and then my foot niggle would come back and I'd have to take two, three, four weeks off and then I'd go, okay, it's good now. And I'd get back into my running and I'd do the same thing. I'd run for, you know, two, three, four weeks um, and then it would pop up again. And this cycle just kept repeating itself. And sometimes I would take two weeks off. Sometimes I would take as much as like eight to 12 weeks off and I just was never getting anywhere. Like my running was just never getting any better. Uh, like I really didn't progress at all for about two years. In fact, I, I went backwards quite a lot. Um, and then like about four to five months ago, I was at this point where I'm like, I, I was seriously just considering like maybe I just won't ever be able to run again. Um, but then in the lead up to the US Open, the PTO US Open, I saw Jan Fredino using a lever, lever running system. Um, 
And then a friend of mine, Hannah Wells, who's also a professional triathlete, I saw her using one a lot and talked to her and she told me about how she was using it for almost all of her running and now she's back running as, as good as she ever has and saw Laura Phillip using one and Braden Curry, Curry using one. I was like, I'm just going to try one of these. So yeah, I, I decided to buy myself a lever running system and I started using it for pretty much all of my runs. Um, in fact, for about the first four to five weeks, it was all of my runs. And um, for those of you who don't know what a lever running system is, it's a system that you put onto a treadmill and then you connect uh, it to like your hips um, using a special special pair of run shorts uh, and it just takes weight off while you run. So my body weight is about 85 kilograms and at the start I was taking like 12 to 14 kilograms off. So my body weight when I was running was like 73 to 71 kilograms. Um, and so yeah, I was just using it at my local gym where I use the treadmills and Basically, what it, what it does is because of that reduction in body weight, it reduces the load through your tendons, joints, bones, um, et cetera, so that you can do more running when you're coming back from injury or even if you're completely injury-free. Um, it's just a way to increase the volume and frequency of your running uh, week to week so that you prevent getting injured because um, running is just such a risky part of triathlon um, and training in general. And it really did change my run training when I started to use one. Uh, I think I've done... Oh God, I reckon I've done like 20 weeks of running now where I've been able to run and um, what I've been do doing now is slowly reducing the amount of time I spend using my lever system um, and reducing the weight uh, I'm taking off while I use it. So now I'm only doing like one, maybe two runs in it per week um, and I take off about six to seven kilograms every time I do it. And I do plan to use it at least once or twice a week for 2024 for the whole year as I really think it's such a safe way to make sure um, you can do some extra running and not get injured. And I've just found that the more consistent I can be and the less injured I am and, and the less breaks I have to take, then the better and better I run. Because uh, like, yeah, for those two years, I just found out that nothing wrecks uh, my running like having to take those two, six, eight, 12 weeks off and you just, you just like find no consistency all because of a stupid, frustrating little niggle because um, you really want to get out there and run. Um, and so, yeah, like after about two months of using it, I was just absolutely loving it. Like I, I couldn't believe how much it had changed my running. It was the most pain-free I'd ever run. I was running more consistently and more frequently week, week after week. And I reached out to Lever, um, to Lever Movement to see if they'd be interested in partnering with the podcast in 2024 just because I loved the product so much. I was like, I just want to tell people about this. So it'd be awesome if they um, partnered with the podcast. Like they didn't give me the, the Lever running system. I went and bought one all, uh, for myself. Um, so it's not like they gave me it and I was promoting it because of that. It's like this is a product I'm using, I'm loving it and I just want to promote it. Um, and they came back and said, yeah, they'd love to partner with the podcast. So they're jumping on to support the podcast in 2024, which I'm really excited about. Um, and if you can relate to why I started using my Lever um, running system or why I'm going to keep using it every week in 2024 and would like to get one for yourself, then you can head to levermovement.com. Um, and I've got a discount code that you can use. It's just TTH. Uh, which gets you a massive 20% off your um, anything from the website. So yeah, that that really does take a bit of price off it, um, which is great. Um, so it does support the show as well. But more importantly, Lever is just a product I know could help so many people because I bought one myself and you know, I just know how much I've bloody loved it and how much I'm going to um, keep using it in 2024 and probably even further on than that. And yeah, since I've got it, I've spoken to even more professional triathletes who I didn't, I had no idea used it because they weren't sponsored by them or anything. They were just using it um, of their own accord like me and they've said the same thing as me that they don't have to be injured to use it. They just use it on top of their running, um, their additional, like it's just like a little additional on top of their run training so that they can increase their volume and um, their mileage and do it in a way where they don't have to risk getting injured, which, yeah, that consistency leads to their running getting um, better and better. So Yep, if you can relate and, and you want to try one and use it for yourself, levermovement.com and use the discount code TTH. I might try and take it back to a couple of more simple questions for you that aren't physiology related, um, Olaf. So the Olympics for Christian are uh, in late July and then after July we have the PTO tour that you know might have four or five races that um, Christian could still do. He has... Kona the, the the men's world championships are back in Kona where he came third and I'm so, sure he feels like he has unfinished business and we have the 70.3 world worlds later in the year than usual in December how do you see Christian's year unfolding do you think he can win the Olympics and then win Kona what what, what might be an ideal world that you guys have planned so I think I think that uh I think that 2024 will probably be the last year in history where it will be possible to transition from Olympics to Ironman distance and 
and uh, win. Uh, we have seen, of course, we paid a little bit of attention to uh, to what others are doing and what times they are producing and so on. And, and and you see basically that that there are progress, but nothing that really. It, it, we already like the pro- projections we made leading into Saint George and Kona. Uh, I think that Kona, we uh, on the right day, we will see a sev- sev- uh, sub seven thirty on Kona. So another, we will shave off another ten minutes, or let's say that would be eleven or twelve minutes in total. But on the right day, you will be able to shave off another eleven, twelve minutes there. But then you are starting to come closer to where you really need to spend a lot of time on 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 investigating okay where where is it possible now to make gains and that might even then be uh, a phase where you end up with more technologically driven uh stages again before you can see um uh, more increase in performance but uh, i think seven sub 730 is something that is uh we will we will we, we, we will see 730 on the right day in kona uh whether we have that day this year or not i don't know but i think again also based on what we see uh others are doing i'm i feel uh, quite comfortable with that uh that uh, it's possible to go back to back Olympics, uh, Ironman World Championship one more time, but in 2028, uh, for sure not, because then it will be two extremely deep fields. You will have a very deep field in in short course, and you will have a very deep field in in Ironman. They are super strong. So it means basically nobody will anymore be able to just convert back and forth. Yes, uh, a, a short course triathlete will be able to potentially fight for the podium uh, in, in the long course, but you can't do that over a couple of months. That will probably ne- you will probably require a year or two, three maybe to to really get get the 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 spe- the, um, the uh, specialization that is requ- that it, that is required to to put out the best yes you can get close to the podium but you will not get to the podium unless you are lucky uh on that day and uh, uh the let's say those the favorites that are that are really strong uh for some reason have a shitty day um but uh olympics yes uh again uh christian was racing in hamburg uh uh, and that was really good performance in the test event. I actually was a little bit surprised. Alex was probably the only one that really got out. Uh, it was fantastic to see all the French uh, being so tightly packed t- together. They are the hosts, uh, and 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 they of course, uh, France have for a long, long time been a super nation in triathlon. They have an incredibly program around triathlon in france with uh, with the french grand prix and, and how things are there french uh, fr- france is really a well-run well-run triathlon uh triathlon nation in 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 all aspects if you if you want to learn how to run triathlon uh, france is definitely one of the nations to look uh, to look to uh, but but I think that uh, Alex was probably the only one that uh, yeah Alex demonstrated where you need to be uh, in in the Olympics. If you if you're not capable of beating that, then then uh, going into that race there will be more like you just hoping that Alex is uh, underperforming. Uh, so Alex is definitely the guy to 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 match against. And uh, of course, also we saw that early on the season that uh, he he there were several of the guys that really matched him. But I think uh, Alex really pre- played his card well. He trained and prepared very well leading in, into into uh, into the Paris test event. And I would say even that uh, all the other races that he did before there were were a part of the build up towards uh, the Paris test event. And the Paris test event is basically what he peaked for, where he really got out his performance and showed what he's what, what he's capable of. But um, I think, again, uh, knowing also how Christian's season was uh, with uh, doing the back-to-back races between long course, short course, where he was in, in, in Hamburg, knowing uh, the, uh, how that was and with, with the Ibiza and then, of course, Hamburg and then he, uh, on to um, uh, US Open and then he... Uh, 
couple of weeks later, he goes to the te- to the testament in Paris. He, lo- he basically when you go to US Open, you lose almost a week of training simply because of, uh, or you don't lose a full week of training, but you lose, let's say, you lose half a week of training, effective, uh, effectively measured in in distance or or or, or joules or in 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 uh, hours. Uh, simply because of the the travels, uh, because of the preparations that is needed, uh, and a time zone acclimatization and so on. So I feel pretty confident that uh, yes, Paris Christian uh, Christian. I I don't worry too much about the other people's performance. Actually, it's more where I just see that Christian has is still growing he's still getting faster and it's more about being smart about how we we are e- really able to leverage that and that means also that when you get even faster and even stronger as well it doesn't mean that you now can just po- copy paste your program your 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 how you taper and all these kind of things because these things also changes that means also that you have to make adjustments here as well there there is very few things in life that are static if anything so it's uh short the, the long and short answer to 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 paris and Kona, uh the answer is yes and yes we wouldn't have done it otherwise and do you think we will see christian also on some pto start lines after the olympics most likely not of course i don't interfere too much with uh, i would be very disappointed if christian suddenly now says to me that i i want to do a lot of pto races uh this year or i want to do a lot of ironman races this year i want to do a lot of super league races this year uh, then i would be then i would be uh, a little bit disappointed because i am all in for the olympics that's what really motivate motivates me but of course if, if christian had some good arguments for why he wanted to do that and 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 it was based in his motivation or other things like this. Okay, well then, then I will adapt it. I will never tell Christian you can't do that race. You shall do that race, because I, I, my, my, my goal is to be. Uh, my responsibility is to make sure that as much as possible around him goes as smoothly as possible. Make sure that he has the best program. That make sure that we are able to find always these new competitive ad- advantages. And and ma- yeah, making sure that he is ready when he is on the start line of the races that he decides to be on. But I have to personally say that I am of course most motivated for the Olympics. But what I do, but what what Christian and Gusta have said is that they are they don't want to do any Ironman races. They don't want to do any PTO races. They don't want to do any Super League races. At least how the season looks now for next year, Super League could probably is is not. I would say that if it fitted like perfectly into the program there, you could probably put in a race like that. Uh, surely you could put in a half Ironman or. Or, or a PTO race into uh, if you if you found the right race at the right te- right time of the season you could put it in there. But there's always, of course, a little bit of additional risk doing a little bit different kind of racing uh, than just sticking to the main plan there. So if uh, so, the plan now for Christian and Gustav is that mainly, of course, since Ironman World Championship is also happening uh, almost a, a month later next year. Oh no! Sorry, this year than 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 it has been previously because now it's the last weekend of October. That means that Christian and Gustav, of course, won. They have to do a qualification race, so we have to do an Ironman distance race. But uh, we can, of course, just make sure that we stay within cutoff times. So that means like swimming in two hours and biking. I don't know in how many hours and walking uh, from 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 T uh, two to the finish line. Of course, they will not do that, but you keep it on the safe side where it just becomes like a long training day long training day and you break it into intervals or whatever but they have to do qualification races and this is already a little bit of suboptimal because it's not exactly what you would say is the best training day and all i say the day, days around that would be the best or most ideal uh so that has to happen uh then of course it's the olympics and then it's kona those are the things that are like fixed on the agenda for next year uh, oh, no, sorry, for this year, I'm already for, like, stuck in 2023, <laughs> but for 2024, those are the main things that are, are on the plan there. So there's no PTO, no PTO races planned uh, for 2024. You're, I'm hearing you looping Christian and Gustav into the same sentence then, but I have to assume that uh, that Gustav's season is going to be a little bit different to Christian's. Um, look, maybe, maybe 
maybe Gustav does make it to the Olympics and and it does end up like that where Gustav and Christian are both targeting the Olympics. They're both targeting Kona. But I had already sort of assumed that maybe Gustav had decided he wasn't going to chase the Olympics. Like I, I'm just sort of throwing around what I was thinking. I, I hadn't thought deeply in it, like or, or thought to ask Gustav or, or yourself or anyone in the team the question. I sort of half just assumed that Gustav would now shift his focus to the PTO um, c- series and probably Kona at the end of the year. Um, I definitely assumed that one of the four PTO wildcard slots, considering that Gustav finished the year unranked um, and didn't get the automatic co- contract for the PTO, I assumed that, that Gustav probably got offered one of them and probably accepted it and was going to try and go and, and win that series and then win Kona and, and wasn't even going to think about the Olympics. But but how do you see Gustav's year playing out? Uh, to be to be honest, actually, uh, the season is exactly the same for for Gustav as it is for Christian. Even the bo- so 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 you you can say that I I don't know, maybe this is the maybe I'm just uh, strangely put together in my head. I don't know, but uh, for me, basically, where Gustav is today. Uh, it's not like I have written him off for the Olympics. Rather the opposite. I work equally hard with Gustav to make sure that he is ready for the Olympics. Whether he, whether that is because something really happens and somebody has to pull out and we are in the camp there and, 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 and then Gustav gets the spot or whether we are able to get back on track even, for, even quicker and he just qualifies the normal way. It, that doesn't really matter for me. It really doesn't matter for me, uh, and it doesn't change. It doesn't change how how I I plan or do this kind of thing because it's not like I tomorrow it has to be that session and in one week it has to be that session in one month it has to be in that session and then 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 two weeks before the Olympics it has to be that session there. Uh, we we have an idea for for I I I have an idea for how. To get Christian, no, to get Christian, I have an idea for how to get Gustav there. And uh, for Gustav, the, the journey is a little bit different, obviously, than it is for for for, for Christian. It would have been if if uh, uh, anyway. So for me, it's just that okay. Uh, in the same way that uh, now I'm working on different tasks with Christian than I that I, that than what I have done before. That's the same with Gustav. It's just different. It's just some different tasks. It's not like, it's not like uh, just because uh, I, I don't I don't know how to better put it. It's it's just tasks, and the tasks are different and they change anyway. And 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 for Christian is one some tasks. Let's say efficiency now. While for for Gustav now it's it's uh, ramping up the running again uh, for him. So so that's why that's why I. Um, uh, Gustav doesn't race in the Olympic when he doesn't race in the Olympics, uh, and we will know that uh, when the race starts in the Olympics. Uh, I, it sounds maybe a little bit strange uh, to say it that way, but it's more like a consequence of that. I don't spend time. I don't spend time on thinking that oh he won't be ready. Uh, maybe we should make a plan B, or we should do something different. Uh, no, it's it, it, we are building Gustav into make be, becoming the fastest machine that he have ever been, and to get there is not dictated by the Olympics. Uh, that's just dictated by how we have to work and how do we have to solve these different tasks and whether that and whether we are uh, and then it's just a matter of are we there are we not there when race day comes uh more or less but i can't spend my energy or time on thinking or worrying about whether we have enough time or or whether we should make a plan b or these kind of things because to build him into peak human performance or, or and, and and exceed that the way I would be working with him would still be the same, independently of what kind of race he would be targeting, and and uh, we don't have to make any like very specific decisions yet for exactly how he needs to run or bike or swim in order to get there. We have for that uh, uh, that is something that will happen closer to the race. Um, so again, it's it's uh, the season for Christian and Gustav are, are, are for me the they exactly the same, especially when Gustav said that Olympics is basically what he wants to do, and then it's Kona, 
uh, and we know that we have to do a qualification race. So, so then that's what I'm committed to, and I don't spend, I don't, I, I can't spend half a percent of energy on on worrying or or thinking that we need to have uh, have a ha, or that we should maybe plan for some other races or these kind of things. We'll we, we'll do that when 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 um, when that time is there uh, to put it. Uh, that way but it, it's more of it's like it, it's more me saying that that are the questions that i don't i don't i don't i don't spend resources on that because it's not important for me it's more important for me to make sure that he reaches peak human performance and then he will be capable of racing whatever race he wants to do if you're going to be taking your triathlon seriously in 2024 then now is the perfect time to get yourself a win republic tri suit win republic tri suits have undergone extensive aerodynamic testing um, they're ridiculously comfy to swim and run in, and they've got all the practical little details covered, like extra pockets for your gels. It's not often you get a really aerodynamic and fast tri suit that is comfy, but Win Republic have just nailed that. And I do think the other thing Win have always done, and they've probably always done better than everyone else, is they make tri suits that actually look good. And there is something about wearing a fun tri suit that looks great that it just makes you really excited to race in it. And now is the perfect time to get yourself one because you can test it out in your preseason training before you get stuck into your serious races. I personally, again, think it's really important that you do some long and hard sessions in your tri suit before you race in it um, so that on race day, it's something you're completely used to. So definitely take advantage of the time you've got now in training before your, your next big race um, to get used to your tri suit, use it on some long rides, use it on some sort of harder runs. Um, I think a lot of people don't run in their tri suit enough, but now is, is literally the perfect time. Um, so head over to Win Republic's website, use the discount code TTH15. That gets you 15% off your tri suit or anything you want to buy. Um, so your whole order from Win Republic. So yeah, go and have a look. Um, there's lots of great designs and, and all of their kits uh, are super fast, super comfortable, and really practical. I just wanted to ask you about one performance from 2023, and that was the Ironman World Championship winning performance of Sam Laidlow in Nice, France. Obviously, Sam Laidlow was, uh, there was a, a bit of a famous story before the 2022 Olympics where it was sort of said that if uh, Sam Laidlow has 10 minutes uh, advantage up the road, it doesn't matter that Christian and Gustav will still beat him. He then basically got that 10 meters and then he, Gustav only just got him and, and, he, and he managed to hold off on Christian. Uh, to finish second in 2022 and then 2023 he comes out and, and wins the the world title very comfortably in completely dominant fashion from beginning to end what did you make of the performance Olav given your close involvement um, in his breakout performance in 2022 in, in that race and and did you think about how might have the Gustav and Christian of 2022 gone against that version of Sam Laidlow at Nice um <laughs> Uh, actually, I I haven't spent again. I don't have very much time to spend, or I I, I spend almost no time actually at all uh, analyzing uh, other people's performance again because it other people's performance doesn't uh, define uh, how I develop peak human performance in Christian Gustav because peak human performance for me is something different, uh, and you just uh, yeah it, that that's something different. You're just trying to see how far can you push. Uh, or how far can you develop performance? And then when you do racing, that's what you are displaying. You're displaying, of course, the current state of your of your of, of your performance. Um, and so I wouldn't like, for example, my let's say race strategies or tactics or how we build programs and these kind of things. I, I don't I don't approach that by looking at other people's splits or how they are doing things and so on. That is something that Christian and Gustav does much more because they are more into the tactics, much more into the tactics uh, and have to be because they have to be able to dynamically uh, make decisions during the race uh, as well. Um, in in uh, yeah, so actually, I, I I of course I have my opinions. I have my opinions on it, but mostly, of course, in in, in I think everybody underestimated Sam in in uh, in um, in Kona 2022. He executed perfectly, and everybody thought, no, no let's let's like let Sam go. He typically uh, always uh, uh, breaks down on the run. He have never done better than a 250 something marathon, so that we we can comfortably give him a 10 minute lead. Uh, uh, but then you just need that one day where everything just fit together and 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 you and you demonstrate to the world that no, I just need that day. 
And of course, the good thing with that is of also that now he knows a little bit. He, you, he gets also more experience, more experience. He, he he runs faster. And I know that they are also very interested in understanding, not like just having a static program, but understanding how can they build things better all the time. So I, I really, I haven't sat down and, and evaluated uh, whether I think that the Christian or where Christian and Gusta would be in uh, in relation to Sam in in in, in Nice. But I know, of course, that they were then str- stronger than they was the year before. So again, I, I maybe, uh, yeah, I would, if we're specialized for that one, I'm pretty sure we would see Christian and Gusta on top of the podium again. But again, that's just my opinion. Uh, and we'll have to wait for uh, Kona this year uh, to, 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 see, to see where uh, where it stacks up. But um, I would say that... Uh, I'm super happy for for Sam. I know that uh, I know that he has been going through quite tough times because people have been accusing them for doping and so on. And I, I have to say that it, it's fine. It's like on this level, everybody have to be able to tolerate it. This is not unique for triathlon. Triathlon, maybe you can say, have even been, been spared of quite a lot for these kind of accusations and these kind of things. Uh, cycling have really been put through the paces there um, to the point where... Uh, teams breaks up and 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 and, and so on um so it's just a part of the game uh when you are at the top people will always accuse you uh there will always be doping ac- accusations so on but i think one thing that i didn't like with the whole process there uh was that i understand that there had been some uh some russia uh police have uh, came and invaded uh, their their home and these kind of things um uh uh, and based on that some people had put forward some allegations to be honest i don't i have very little knowledge about this it might be that i'm saying this even wrong um uh, because i didn't really read this i heard i got this from other people that told told this to me what a little bit what had happened there uh over uh, a coffee or something like that but i think that the like it, what is important for me is that the only way we can really fight against doping And there will probably always be people trying to dope as well. But the only real way we can minimize it is that everybody has to cooperate and even force the organizers to put in far more strict doping control regimes. We have to have faith in VADA and we have to support VADA in building even better programs doing much more testing and this will always be a game of cat and mice it's just it's just how it is and how it will be it's it's in the same in in, in the finance world people are always will, will always try to cheat taxes or these kind of things and and that's why we have like there you have uh, i'm not sure the right english word for it but you have like you have police or like you have you have um uh, departments specialized in 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 financial crimes because people are cheating there as well. So you could call that a kind of doping your own organization or whatever. And pe- and even individuals cheating there. And so this will always be this will always be the case. But of course, in the financial world, we have like ver- there, of course, things are being monitored even more rig- rigorously than it is in, in, in the sports world. But like encouraging and 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 really working together with VADA to build better programs, build better, better technology, even we of course we have today continuous glucose monitors these we can easily increase the amount of markers that are being uh, being being measured i'm not sure if we should enforce everybody to use these sensors but on the other side i think that most people would actually be willing to wear like in the same way you wear continuous glucose monitors why wouldn't you wear a continuous continuous uh, vada monitor that just sits there and you just replace it every 14 day or whatever like this It's a simple, very, very simple way. I have a meeting now coming up in a couple of minutes that I have to jump on, but, um, but this, the only way we can really, um, and the only way to really do this is to make sure that we, we go through the right channels and let the right channels deal with this in a proper way. Uh, that's the way, that's the way and the really right way to do this. So I have to say that I, I, have no problem understanding that this like last year has must have been a really tough year for them because uh, the victory 
let's say all the positiveness and all the the good things that should be around winning a race like that and how basically this is controlled for what kind of I, of course I'm, i i i don't know christian gustav is under the olympic uh, olympic uh, anti doping program and there there are quite rigor, rigorous testing they are i don't know i don't remember exactly the numbers in my head now but if i say at least let's say around 12 times a year so let's say on average once a month at least are they tested including all the other testings that we do as well that we can of course put forward as documentation but the point is that I, I I hope I can only hope for that Ironman has the same kind of program, and that we continue to support and make this even better, because it's the only way to make sure that uh, sure that uh, things happen in the right way. And then again, also that people when you when you have won, and you have been tested, surely there will always be doctors, but. It should be something that you can celebrate, a victory that you can celebrate and you can really enjoy. You can, you, 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 where people around, uh, yeah, it, it, it is a celebration. That's why, uh, if if it's not that, then then you have to question: Is it really worth it? So I, I don't know if I have anything better to say around that really than than. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, people shouldn't uh, like. The right instances should spend their time on that one, and then athletes and coaches should spend their time on on uh, making sure that people are uh, as fit as possible, and uh, yeah, that we, we build a sport that really people wants to be a part of, not a, po- a sport that is, is 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 associated with a lot of negative negativeness. Or, or cheating or things, but a sport which is really a f- sport that fascinates people because it's c- really cool technology developments. It's less rigorous than other types of racing. You can go a little bit more bananas with your bikes. Maybe they're opening up with shoe development, so we can go a little bit more bananas with the shoe development, a little bit more bananas on on on, on the speed suits and, and and wetsuit development. So a place where 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 all the product manufacturers really wants to be because it's a super innovative and positive field to work with and athletes and coaches that are truly innovating always trying to push the boundaries of what is possible and it's just the coolest sport to be a part of olav i know you've got to uh, make a move in a second i've got two more questions i want to i want to ask you so up to you how quickly you answer them i guess but i I will accept as little as one word answers for them (laughs) in 2022 olav I think that was the year you burst onto the scene. Now, people in the in the triathlon world knew, knew about you before that, well before that, as a matter of fact. But 2022, you became one of the top five stars in triathlon. Everyone was talking about the Norwegian method, Christian Gustav and Olav Alexander Boo. They needed a, a week. Everyone at Kona had to take a week off work who lives there to uh, clean up all the lactate strips because of uh, yourself uh, <laughs> and your methods. You were everywhere. You could not, there was not a week in triathlon in 2022 where, where you weren't seen or talked about. Then in 2023, the, the year just gone, you almost disappeared from triathlon, Olav. Like Christian was, was as big as ever. Gustav obviously had the year he had, but you sort of went into the background a little bit and we didn't hear from you. Um, definitely nowhere near the amount we did in 2022. What can we expect from you in 2024? Where where will you be? Will you be one of the biggest stars in the sport or will you sort of be in the background again? Again, I think uh, or my motivation is I, I don't really have any uh, big desires to be in the front seat unless it can make a difference for Christian and Gustav. So for me, I can also be invisible uh, and I, I would be super happy with that as long as I can do the things that really matters to me. And that is the pursuit for peak human performance. Um, actually, I haven't even reflected over that I was uh, less present uh, in the public or visually uh, in 2023. So that's actually how little attention I actually I paid to that. <laughs> uh, simply because it's again, it, that's not my desire. My desire is simply the pursuit of peak human performance. And of course, I love sharing the findings and and the things we do. To, and, and help educate other people and motivate and inspire other people to do it. But it's not it's not for myself. 
Um, 2024, yes, it's the Norwegian method uh, documentary and it's also the podcast. So surely, of course, uh, that will, uh, where I will be more present, but I actually have no media plan or I don't have any plans like this. This is uh, Adam that deals with this and it has to fit into the program. And on the other side, also I know that this year is going to be an extremely busy year for two reasons. One, enthalpy. So the software or the AI systems that we are building uh, is also now starting to be used by some teams around in the world, uh, in, in Olympic and, and World Tour teams and so, but uh, or other racing teams. And uh, that's going to require quite a lot of my attention. Then, of course, it's the, the Santar Tech and all our partners and the work that we do that to advance technology. And then on the other side also, and the most important, it's the performance of Christian and Gustav. And so it it really depends on whether I'm able to fit anything more into the schedule or not. And if it fits in there, I'm more than happy to to jump on calls and other things like this. But it's I know this is going to be probably one of the most hectic and craziest year in a long time. Simply also because on top of what we have done before is also now that we are we have started to work on quite a lot of articles. So that's uh, that's the long and short answer to that one. Yeah, and thank you for taking the time out of your schedule, Olaf, to have this conversation with me and to spend so long talking to me. Again, it's just what me and you do, isn't it? We get on these calls and we say, yeah, we'll do an hour and you know, almost three hours later and we're still here. That's exactly what happened last time. Um, I, do, I do appreciate it, Olaf. I really do. Um, uh, my last question, I'm going to challenge you, Olaf. I really am going to challenge you because I know you like to deep dive, but one word answer. You cannot say more than one word answer and then... Once you say that answer, we'll hang up the podcast. I know 2024 was the the year you've been building to forever. You wanted to win the Olympics. You wanted to win the Ironman World Championships. You wanted to come back and win the Olympics. And I remember having a conversation with you two years ago where we were talking about the day that the 2024 Olympics were done. And, and you said that when that day come, you're, you're very likely that you won't be in triathlon anymore, that you will have done everything you wanted to do in the sport. And then I heard Christian talk about it uh, as well and he said you who knows where we'll see Olaf in 2025 so let's say in a hypothetical world you achieve what you want to achieve this year Christian wins uh, the, the the Olympics Gustav or Christian win Kona are we more likely to see you in triathlon in 2025 or are we more likely to see you as an F1 performance engineer in 2025 <laughs> uh, uh... <laughs> Uh, so, uh, oh, where does this come from? Um, uh, <laughs> I think we'll just have to wait to see. Uh, there is a lot of interesting opportunities out there. I started to work a little bit uh, on the side uh, as a mentor or as a coach for some of these environments. And um, uh, yeah, we, we'll, ju we'll just have to see because... Um, there is a lot of things going on that is very exciting, but uh, I'm not 100% ready to talk about it yet. So let's let's see, let's see, let's see what we end up with, uh, and then uh, we, we'll touch on that uh, next time we catch up. I'm excited to hear about it. <laughs> Olaf Alexander type and, and Max Verstappen. <laughs> well, well, I'm, here, uh, I'm hearing the may, rumors. Maybe, Olaf. maybe maybe we should work on. Maybe we should bring up uh, up up and coming stars. Stars, some, somebody that that isn't that well established, or maybe it should be just making the best one in the world better. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. We'll see what sport, what sport, and what team it is. Uh, or yeah, because I will definitely continue to work with Christian and Gustav. Amazing. Olav, thank you, mate. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll, we'll talk soon. I appreciate it. Thank you.